seated. Please be seated. Yes, everyone is seated, perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, let me warmly welcome you to the workshop. We are very happy to have you here, both on the spot in the Observatory and Planetarium of Brno and at home by your computers. Before we start, let me um, run you through some housekeeping information. First of all, um, as I've mentioned, we've got people on the spot, we've got people watching uh, through WebEx, and I would also like to say that the entire event is being streamed and recorded uh, on YouTube. Uh, we have a Slido platform, which you can use to ask any questions that you might have. I would like to encourage the audience here in the, in the planetarium to also raise their hand and um, our assistants will uh, come to you to, with the microphone so that you can ask on the spot. But you can also use the Slido and I would also like to encourage everyone on the WebEx or on the YouTube to also use it. But uh, due to the missing signal, it might be a little bit slow. So be patient, please. Uh, use the Slido and uh, we will... Um, we will get to your questions. Right now, in the Slido, there are already four initial questions which we would like you to, to answer so that we get to know you a little bit better and we know what your background is and um, what, your, what your purpose of being here with us today is. Um, we will have an, uh, a full afternoon of discussions and, and speeches, but a part of this during the coffee break, uh, as you might have already noticed, there is a team in the foyer of, um, of the Technical University of Brno, which have come here from the lighting laboratory uh, to show you uh, the latest devices that they are working on. It's a measurement devices for obtrusive light. So you are very welcome to go ahead, ask them what it is, maybe even try if they let you. And um, I think that's all from me. And let us start the event by a video. Bylo, nebylo. V jedné docela průměrné spirální galaxii najdeme hvězdu, kolem níž obíhá osm planet. A na jedné z nich se rozkládá jeden docela obyčejný kraj. Není tu ani moc zima, ani moc teplo. A lidé se zde dožívají pozoruhodně vysokého věku. Vedou se spory o tom, jestli to způsobuje dobrá voda, anebo víno. Já se přikláním k tomu vínu, ale to není podstatné. Zkrátka, je to místo, které stojí za návštěvu. Já vím, teď si říkáte, proč vás zvu na návštěvu, když tady bydlíte a znáte to tu. Ale co takhle podívat se na stará známá místa z nových, neznámých úhlů? Bude to tak trochu jiný vyhlídkový let. Let prostorem, ale i časem. Zdá se vám to neuvěřitelné? No jistě, když Jižní Morava je neuvěřitelný kraj.
And now it's my pleasure to welcome the first speaker of today, His Excellency Mr. Jiří Dušek, the Senator and also the Director of this Observatory and Planetarium, thanks to whom we can be here today. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the city of Brno and of course uh, the Brno Observatory and Planetarium especially. Uh, I studied astrophysics uh, 30 years ago and I remember light pollution uh, was mainly an astronomical problem at that time. Uh, uh, the public has called us, um, uh, called astronomers, uh, dark lovers uh, in the past. Uh, now uh, we know uh, global light pollution is continuously increasing and it's a global environmental uh, problem which affects all of us. Uh, I am very pleased uh, we can discuss light pollution and how to reduce light pollution in Europe today. Uh, we have to chance uh, to change uh, the global trends and be friendlier uh, to our world. Uh, it will not be easy. But unlike other problems, uh, this problem can be solved uh, with the speed of light. I'm joking, of course. It, uh, uh, it, it will not be so easy. Uh, I'm not just the director of Brno Observatory and Planetarium, but uh, I'm a member of the Senate of the Parliament of the Czech Republic. And uh, light pollution is part of my agenda. Uh, and I can say, as a director and as the senator, uh, that I fully support proposed conclusions uh, of today's uh, workshops. Uh, and I am really happy that I can be with you. Once again, uh, thank you very much for your visit. And I wish you a pleasant stay and interesting discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dušek. And now, on behalf of the Ministry of Environment, I would like to ask Mr. Jan Dusik, the Deputy Minister for the Section of Climate Protection. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my great honor uh, to welcome you today on behalf of the Ministry of Environment uh, and the Czech Presidency of the European Union uh, Council. Uh, we would like to thank uh, our host, uh, His Excellency uh, Jan Dušek and the team of the Brno Observatory and Planetarium for preparing the workshop together with us. Natural darkness has uh, the same value as clean water, air or soil or stable climate. More than half of all animals and insects and most of amphibians need a nocturnal environment. By losing the dark night environment, we create further negative impacts on ecosystems and the environment. And if we can reduce excessive lighting in places and at times when there is no reason or necessity, we will not only reduce the burden on the environment, but also save money in terms of energy costs uh, and uh, in times of energy crisis uh, we are facing today. It is also very important that uh, measures taken to tackle light pollution have a synergetic effect. Reducing light pollution means protecting biodiversity and habitats uh, while contributing to mitigating climate change and the production of other pollutants associated with energy production. In our efforts to protect the environment and climate, we try to explain why the proposed measures are important for individuals and the society and we look for acceptable solutions. The same applies to light pollution. I have to say that this debate has been going on for maybe too many years and has been going on since I was last uh, deputy minister and minister about uh, 12 years ago. Unfortunately, I can say uh, that many of our environmental problems uh, are facing this uh, slowness of our reaction, the decline of biodiversity, the progress of climate change. The discussions are lengthy uh, and the change is uh, not fast enough. Perhaps we should speed up and uh, be prepared to compromise in order to get further in solving this very problem in the context of the current crisis and uh, together with uh, addressing the looming climate and biodiversity uh, crisis. The Minister of Environment uh, has been actively addressing the issue of light pollution since 2017 and has now declared it one of its uh, key priorities for the Czech Presidency. 
It is thanks to the presidency that we have the opportunity to coordinate and elaborate at European level on topics that are already in the legislative process, but also to open up new topics and draw European and international attention to them, like the topic of light pollution. Today's workshop was designed in particular to bring together the representatives of the national administrations of the EU member states and the European Commission to discuss their experiences or your experiences uh, in reducing light pollution where the, uh, in countries where the issue is already being addressed and to call for support for joint action at the EU level and also in the neighboring countries. We have chosen this group precisely because it is the national administrations and the European Commission that have the possibility to, to grasp and address the topic. We have 19 uh, representatives of the European uh, countries uh, present either physically or remotely and uh, altogether about 80, 80 people uh, registered for this hybrid event. The presidency of the Czech Republic has prepared a background paper for the workshop in, in li entitled Light Pollution Reduction Measures in Europe. The document maps light pollution reduction measures in individual European countries and it clearly shows that most countries are trying to address uh, the issue in some way be it legislation already, standards, manuals, research projects, awareness campaigns or other measures. And Anna, my colleague, uh, will describe more in detail about uh, our findings. The outcome of uh, our workshop uh, should be the Brno appeal to reduce light pollution in Europe. The appeal aims to encourage uh, a Europe-wide and coordinated solution to the problem of uh, the light pollution. We want to present our outcomes to the European Commission and also at the December uh, meeting of the EU uh, Environment Council of Ministers. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wish us all a thought-provoking workshop full of insights uh, and inspiration. And uh, we are very much looking forward uh, to uh, agreeing on the Brno appeal and uh, then presenting it further uh, within uh, our work in the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dusik. And now uh, let's um, welcome our next guest, uh, Mr. Ruskin Hartley, from the, the executive director of the International Dark Sky Association. And just reminding, uh, try out the Slido, please. Answer our first, quest uh, four, first four questions and ask the questions of your own. Thank you. Well, I could, is that working? It's a great pleasure to be here. As a Brit now living in the United States in Tucson, Arizona, it's wonderful to be in the Czech Republic and part of the EU to talk about this really important issue of light pollution. And I'm just going to start by saying four years ago, despite having worked in conservation uh, for more than 20 years, I had never really even heard about light pollution, let alone thought about it as a real issue that I should be concerned about. And, and I think I am, in a sense, four years ago, part of the problem that we all need to collectively solve because I should have been working on it. I'd been working on forest conservation and water issues and had never really thought about it. But over the last four years, uh, by working with so many generous people in the light pollution community, I've, I've had a wonderful schooling in what's going on. I wanted to start here. Now, I'm sure some of you recognize this. This is Lascaux, right? One of the classic pieces of early art, probably globally and certainly here in Europe. Uh, what, 15 to 17,000 years ago? Some of the first Europeans, as it were, came and they found this cave and they started to record things that were important to them, these wonderful images of, of the wildlife that was in the continent at that point. And we could talk about what's happened to the wildlife in the continent because this stuff ain't there anymore. Uh, but what is also really remarkable is some more recent research suggests actually some of the things that they're recording is the night sky above them. So uh, on the left, you can see the bull, Taurus. Uh, no, I think the left is Orion. Then there's the bull, Taurus. And you can see those uh, sort of, what are they, six stars? Probably seven is the Pleiades. So when they went into those caves recording their experience, what they're recording is really their connection to the sky above. 
And I think almost the history of civilization has really been a history of art and science has been a history of understanding our relationship with the cosmos, understanding our relationship with the sky above and recording our connection with the stars. Now, any of you from the Czech Republic <laughs> understand that. You know, this is what, 1410, roll, roll, you know, 15,000 years later, we're, we're still trying to understand our relationship with the stars above us in this incredible astronomical clock that I had the pleasure to see in, in Prague on, on Monday afternoon. And it's remarkable when the, the hour come by and the little skeleton comes up and you think, wow, these people were able to come up with this mechanical wonder, but all in an attempt to capture, again, what was happening in the heavens, what was happening with their relationship with the stars above. Now, the sad thing now is if you stand in the middle of uh, Prague in the old square at, at night and want to see the stars above, really the only place you can see it now is in the blue canopy. I don't have a great photo of it there, but above the clock, if you go and stand it, is a deep blue canopy studded with golden stars. And yet, yet this is Europe today, right? Or Europe a few years ago in Brussels, probably one of the most light polluted spots on the planet. It, it's wonderful, right? This civilized, the, the, the symbol of progress and ingenuity is the light bulb. And look what we've done with the light bulb over the last 15,000 years. We've really blotted out and changed our relationship with the stars above. I'm here to sort of just remind everyone that no need reminding really, but light pollution really is a global issue. This is Fabio Fauci's groundbreaking research looking at the New World Atlas, mapping the impact of light pollution uh, across the planet. And this is really those, 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 those colors, remember, this is what an observer from the ground would perceive as they look up. It's not the same as some of the imagery you'll see later from the satellite looking down. And essentially what it's telling us is 83% um, of people on the planet <laughs> and 99% in Europe and North America live under light polluted skies. Again, no surprise for anyone here, but I think it's all important just to remind ourselves this is not an issue in the Czech Republic. This is not an issue in Central Europe. This is not even a Europe-wide issue. This is really a global issue. It's, a, it's an issue of civilization. It's a, light pollution really tracks economic activity. And it's growing globally. This is some of the work from Alejandro. I'm sure he'll touch on it later. Um, it's growing globally. It's growing up, estimates twice the rate of population growth. Uh, you can see those graphs there for, across the various continents. And, and the, those of you who looked at this, the sort of various gray bars are sort of the error ranges of you know, really what is happening. Is light pollution stable? Well, <laughs> probably not. By all estimates, if we actually look at the color temperature that's going on, light pollution is growing pretty rapidly. And, and the projections are will continue to grow unless we take assertive action. Um, over the last 25 years, it's grown at least 49%, 400% uh, in some regions, and you know, reasonable estimates in most parts of the world, it's probably doubled over the last 40 to 25 years, growing essentially at twice the rate of population growth. So this chart, this is the future. <laughs> Which future do we want? And I think for most of us here, even stabil stability is not what we're looking for. We're actually looking for reclaiming some of those dark skies. But as has also been mentioned, why, why care about it? I, I started with the view of the stars, and clearly that is important. It's inspiration, it's part of our culture and heritage, but no surprise here, it, it impacts so many other things. In terms of people, almost every single week there's a study that comes out looking at the impact of light pollution and light at night on our circadian rhythms. There was one recently, they look at some of the gene mechanisms, they're beginning to really understand what's going on. So. Um, some meta studies, if you live under some of the highest areas of light pollution, you're 14% more likely uh, to have some certain types of breast cancer. So this is a real public health issue. The other piece that we're learning, uh, from, particularly from studies that are coming out of the United States, is how it's impacting different communities. And no surprises here, <laughs> if you live and if you're poorer, if you live in a more disadvantaged community, you're more likely to live under high levels of light pollution. So it is a social justice, it is an equity issue. Um, plants, Plants tend to get overlooked when we talk about light pollution. Some studies that came out recently uh, showed really that in cities, in highly light polluted areas, uh, 
they were able to tease out the relative impact of light pollution on plants versus climate change and heat, and particularly around bud break and leaf drop. And we all know that as, our, as the world's getting hotter, we're scrambling our ecosystems. Plants tend to think that spring's coming later and fall's happening later. Well, they, for the first time, teased out what's the impact of light pollution. They found the impact of light pollution was equivalent to the impact of global heating. Now, just think about that. We're, we're adding our global heating, our and then we're adding light pollution on the top of it. So, my goodness, these poor plants, what, what are they going to do? And clearly, pollinators, we got David from Bug Life here, and he was just sharing with me of what over the last 16, 17 years in the UK, there's been a 70% decline in insects. You should really care about that if you care about where your food is coming from. Uh, I certainly remember growing up in England, you're driving across the countryside and you always have to clean your windshield <laughs> uh, when, when you've been driving. If you don't have to do that anymore, and that's not a good thing, right? It, it's not a good thing. And clearly light pollution is not the only source of uh, stress on these pollinators. It's one of many, but it's one that we have to solve and that we can get a handle on. Um, protected areas. A lot of this research tends to focus on the impact on individual plants or animals, but we know that light pollution is impacting whole ecosystems. Uh, there's some studies coming out that suggest, uh, found that key biodiversity, uh, key biodiversity areas, about 50% of those are impacted by light pollution, and upwards of 70% of the areas on the planet that we deem protected in parks, conservation lands are impacted by, wild, uh, by, impacted by light pollution. So are they really protected if we're allowing the light from remote cities to creep in? I would argue that they're not. Culture and heritage, clearly <laughs> our connection with the night sky is important, particularly for traditional communities. You no know, wayfaring communities in the Pacific and others. You no know, people, that connection is such an important part of what it means to be human. And yet there's a whole generation that's growing up absent those connections. And I think particularly at this, this time when Europe is facing an energy crisis, um, we need to do everything we can to save every watt of energy so that we can make sure that people can continue, you know, can be warm during the winter. Um, the, the work that Alejandro, I'm sure, will share later indicates that we're wasting 38 terawatt hours of energy each year just to light up the, the night sky. It's the energy that the satellites are sensing that they were flying over. A conservative estimate is that's 10 billion euros that's being spent to light up the Vera satellite, essentially. It, it seems like we could probably find better things to do with 10 billion euros, and we could certainly find better ways to direct 38 terawatt hours of energy each and every year across the continent. I wanted to just touch what is light pollution. And again, mo everyone here knows this, but just a reminder, there's really different aspects of this. A lot of the conversation tends to be about sky glow. That's clearly important. This is the city of Los Angeles from 50 miles away and up the coast in Malibu. That's the impact of millions and billions of unshielded lights shining in the sky or bouncing off reflected surfaces, and that impacts species over large, large areas. Uh, spill light. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a shot from London. I would not want to be trying to sleep in one of those rooms. It would be pretty tough, even if you had a blackout curtain. Uh, th those street lights are meant to be shining in the street. It seems pretty bright to me, but they're also blasting directly into those bedroom windows. Those kids trying to get a good night's sleep so they can get up and learn the next day. Pretty tough. And, of course, glare. Uh, glare, you can have the light at the right level, all the good things going, but if it catches your eye, these bright, intense LED sources now, they, my goodness, they can be distracting, uh, both from a disability perspective and, and untold impacts that go around this. And, and for many people, this is probably how they perceive light pollution. You know, who, who here loves it when you're driving down a road at night and one of those uh, fancy new cars comes on with the, the, the high, bright headlights? You know, who, who likes that? Put your hand up if you enjoy that, right? People understand what glare is. We can use glare as a way of getting at light pollution. I don't have many graphs. I did want to share this graph, and I think this is an important one, because this looks at the natural range of darkness and light from 120,000 lux during the day. But you look at this, 0 0.001 lux at night. That's what natural darkness is. Even if we choose to light our streets to one lux, which is not very much, that's a thousand times greater than natural darkness. So to think about that, a thousand times greater for one lux. 10 lux, whatever it is, 100 lux would be 100,000 times greater 
the natural darkness. So if I want one message in all of this is really think about a lot of the discussions about spectrum and color. I think we need to be have more of an emphasis on light levels, when we're lighting, how much we're lighting. This is from one of, uh, we're fortunate to have some great board members at IDA, Kevin Gaston. This is from one of his papers. I think it is the key challenge for all of us. How do we maximize the benefits of outdoor light at night while simultaneously limiting its cost in environmental and financial terms? Critically, it's not about saying no to light. It's about saying yes in the right way. A couple of years ago, IDA joined forces with the Illuminating Engineering Society, uh, which is primarily a, a US-based body, but they do have a global footprint around something we kind of coined the five principles of responsible lighting. You can have three, you can have seven, we chose five. <laughs> um, the message is really the same. It's the message that's in the report that, that the ministry has put together. Um, and it really says you need to start with natural darkness. And then our encouragement is to really add light only when it's needed and really think about these principles in order. First, is the light useful? If it's not useful, don't put it there. That's almost a binary thing, right? It's on off. Once you've decided to put it there, make sure you're pointing it down. Any uplight has a huge impact on the environment. Second, think about the intensity. Less is more. Less is actually better for visibility. We need to change that narrative. The really exciting future is around controls. We, we can have the light when we need it. We can have it dimmed down and turned off when we don't need it. That's really the frontier here. This, this is the way we can align with industry and make rapid progress here, selling more widgets to control the light that we decide we need to use. And fifth, and I do want to put it in order, and say fifth is think about the color spectrum. Uh, think about using warmer color lights when you need, when you, when possible, and using that short wavelength only when you need it. Now, clearly, there are instances where you have no control over the light levels or the other aspects, and so that becomes an important variable. But I encourage everyone to think about that in order, not think about the spectrum first. So I'm excited to be here because I think there's really an opportunity to act now, and I think there's a great Bono appeal before you. Uh, and, and we're really calling on sort of identify three areas here. Um, first is to recognize artificial light at night for what it is. It is a source of environmental pollutant. Even at low levels, even one lux of light is a source of environmental stress, right? Even if it's useful, it is still a source of stress. Uh, the second, include light pollution in your existing laws in Natura 2000, the zero action plan, uh, the, 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 all of the, the initiatives that are underway across Europe, the biodiversity protection, they can all benefit from the inclusion of light pollution control. I know many of us in this room would love to have an EU-wide directive for uh, artificial light at night, and us, but we don't need that now. We need to be pragmatic about this. We can use the existing regulations, the existing laws to make progress rapidly. And I think we can also use the sort of the power of the purse and the power of innovation, the power of grants and the power of the markets to really promote the development of best practices to mitigate light pollution. Europe already has some of the leading lighting manufacturers in the world. You know, if you can get them to change, the impact will be felt beyond the borders of Europe and can be a real source of innovation that will call ripple across the world. And hopefully it's good for their businesses, right? We want them to sell better lights. I wanted to close with this, come back to Laskow. So as a kid, probably about 85, I visited Laskow with my parents. Uh, only I didn't visit the original Laskow, I visited Laskow Du. I hear that there are now four of them, some of them traveling. Um, we couldn't go into the original cave because it was being protected from our breath and our moisture. So they recreated it. They created a, an exact replica that you could go into and experience not dissimilar to also as a child visiting the planetarium in London, much as we're here. And I was going to really ask you, do we want a future where people have to go into recreations of the natural night sky to experience what it used to be like out there? Or do we want to take some steps that we can start to reclaim the night sky above our cities? This was in Leiden uh, over the summer where Dan Rosgaard uh, worked with that community to turn off all the lights and kind of inspire that sense of wonder just for one night. No, I'm not, I don't want to leave you the message that we need to turn off all the lights every night. But I do think that by reclaiming the natural night sky over time, we can write to introduce that sense of wonder into people's daily, people's daily lives.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruskin, for bringing this uh, US slash IDA perspective to Central Europe. I would like to ask you to remain uh, with us because we still have some time for questions. Uh, maybe we can start with questions from the audience. If anyone would like to ask something, in case you didn't ask through Slido, which I strongly recommend you do. May I ask a microphone? Yeah, thank you, Raskin, for giving the IDA perspective. Uh, the original IDA... I'm, I'm sorry, can you also add your name, please? I am Günther Wuchtel from Austria, and uh, I work at the Kufner Observatory. And I, I have to confess I'm an astronomer. <laughs> so, Raskin, the original IDA motto was uh, dark skies through quality outdoor lighting. And my question is, how do you balance the competing interest in your organization in particular with the finances uh, that IDA relies on? I, I'm confident that we, we base our uh, the guidance in what the evidence say. We have, an we have an independent board, we have an independent technical committee, so I stand by the recommendations that we made. Uh, we still stand by the belief that the answer to light pollution comes in promoting quality lighting where it's needed and ensuring that naturally dark areas remain dark. Thanks, Gunther. Thank you very much for the question and for the answer. And we have time for one more question, if I may. And that has come through Slido. Mr. Zbigniew is asking, uh, do you plan some platform with positive references and the same with correct and list of manufacturers and products with low blue spectrum or low Kelvin? Yeah, so there's a couple of questions about spectrum. And, and what do you think CCT as a parameter to control light pollution is useful? And the other one is about spectrum uh, uh, and low Kelvin. Uh, so clearly from a technical perspective, we all know that color, color, correlated color temperature is an imperfect measure uh, and, and it can be gamed. You can have two fixtures with the same color, correlated color temperature that have very different impacts on vision, on the night sky, on wildlife and health. So we, we recognize it is an imperfect, it is a poor metric. However, it is also the metric that we have at this point. So we, as we have in the past, we call on the standard setting bodies to come up with a better approach that we can use. And, and the, the reality is today, if you go and specify a source, that's what you're gonna have to use. In terms of fixtures and manufacture with, with low blue spectrum, the exciting thing here is we're seeing more and more manufacturers, the chip manufacturers coming out with sources that have very different spectrum, sources that have no light in certain wavelengths that correspond to circadian activity, for instance. But also, critically, these new sources have higher efficiency, so you don't have to jeopardize that. They have a higher color rendering index. So it's really exciting to see that the manufacturing industry has responded to the challenge that's being put out. Uh, by everyone in the light pollution industry. So we have a long way to go, but we're on the right path. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ruskin. Uh, you've been very efficient because by answering the, this question, you've also answered the, the, the second question. And uh, uh, the time's up, so I will <laughs> let you sit down. And thank you very much. There's one remaining question in the Slido, but maybe we can save it for later because it's about monitoring and evaluating and we might hear something more about that uh, throughout the day. So I would like to welcome now Mrs. Anna Paskova, the Director of Department of Environmental Policy and Sustainable Development from the Ministry of the Environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, really great to see you in person or uh, online. And uh, before I start, I would ask for uh, showing us what are the results for uh, from the Slido uh, poll, because now we would like to see who is here from where and what are the ideas about how to solve uh, the problem of uh, light pollution. So, colleagues from Germany. <laughs> Guten Tag. Um, 
And then, of course, uh, I think uh, many, many people also filled in Bruno because we are here uh, in Bruno. Okay, so, okay, well, uh, the task is set, uh, as uh, our deputy minister said, we targeted uh, the public administration, but we are very happy to have academia also here on board, NGOs, but also private companies, because those are the ones who are, uh, you know, preparing uh, tangible projects. Okay, so about the tools. Who, which are the most efficient? Okay, legislation and standards. That will be our first panel. Then research, then awareness raising, regional planning tools, only 13%, 12%. And funding, no one wanted for, for funding. Okay, no funds are needed. Good, good to know. As uh, <laughs> state administration is good to know, okay. Um, and the last question, okay. I think maybe we can then uh, send it uh, with like afterwards with conclusions uh, and we will assess also uh, what we got from uh, this poll. So thank you very much. And now I would like to go back uh, to my presentation. Uh, I would also start with this view of Earth. Uh, because uh, when we together with Senate organized a public hearing on light pollution, the topic was light, a good servant, but a bad master. And you can see tangibly what uh, civilization has done throughout development and how we affected uh, the environment by light during the night uh, as the light is seen as a development, you know, when there is a globe uh, and you have a dark place, there is no development. But I really hope we will uh, get into the state that uh, the development with no pressure is uh, what we really, really need. I put uh, on this slide the visual effects because when you realize lighting projects, you consider human eyes, right? But you don't consider the other animals. Uh, and we are not living alone on this uh, planet Earth. And why does it matter when we lit up the night? It does matter for a lot of species. More than 50% of mammals, they need the nightscape. Also more than 50% of insects, uh, also almost all amphibians, they really, really need the nightscape to orient them their self and to uh, to live. Now we get to non-visual effects. This is like really basic chart. Uh, I mean, the research is still evolving, but you can really see what kind of spectrum is the most harmful, and then you have the less harmful spectrums. And you can also see the charts showing the status of habitats and status of uh, species according to respective uh, European directives. And what we see that even though we protect our nature, our biodiversity, the species themselves, but also their habitats, uh, the decline is still going on. The red is bad status. The yellow one is unfavorable or poor status. And unfortunately also some percent of, uh, of the poor status is still declining. declining. It's not going uh, the other way around to, to be moving towards a good, good status. So we do a lot of effort to um, protect our environment. We know that uh, the most stressful thing or the main pressure lies also with agriculture and different pollutants. But we have to consider also that we are not protecting the habitats during the night. And they are also affected and um, Ruskin has thought about it. So please just think about it because all our efforts may not realize in protection 
if we are not going to consider also protection of night environment. And why it is a problem? I know you are, you know, professionals, so this not this is not uh, new. But uh, we started to solve the problem because of the rollout of LED technologies. And LED technologies, they are great. You know, they are efficient. They provide us also, uh, they are compatible with control mechanisms. They are, you know, better for direction. But we need to use them wisely. And because we know that spectrum matters, we really need to consider what kind of negative external effects we get when we use different, you know, uh, spectrum for outdoor purposes. And also we know, and also it was some of the questions from, from the Slido, that uh, correlated color temperature is a clue, but it really matters what's the spectral distribution. And you can see the difference between 5,000 kelvins and PC, PC amber. So to sum up once again, what is light pollution? Uh, this is not a technical definition, to be honest, but we can sum it up as a set of adverse effects of artificial light. You have heard about ecology, you have heard about health. So I just want to once again repeat that we really alter ecosystems with night during the uh, with light during the night we alter predator prey relations uh, we alter mating behaviors we alter migratory routes and uh, we have to realize we should do better uh, during night with outdoor lighting also when it comes to energy we have already heard about 38 terawatts, and I'm really looking forward to the presentation of Alejandro uh, to learn more. And also that uh, we have to care also about uh, our cultural heritage, which is the starry night sky. Also, I would like to point out there are different sources of artificial lights at night. We have worked a lot with colleagues on public lighting and road lighting, because this is the area which is regulated somehow. But it wouldn't be fair to point only at public lighting and road lighting. You can see the picture. It's the picture of Brno. And uh, our colleagues will tell you more about the experiment, I would say, they have done. And uh, the left part is Brno without public lighting on. And you can see there still a lot of artificial light sources. So we have to be talking about outdoor sports grounds as well, but also about industrial working sites and private business properties, for example, parking lots. Also about architectural lighting. Do we need it? How we should design it? What intensity? What color spectrum? A lot of has to be done also on advertising and billboards, because those are really, especially in the big cities, uh, the major sources of light pollution. And we have to also talk about private buildings and properties, what we as individuals can do to reduce our own impacts. And with current uh, you know, uh, context, uh, everyone is looking for energy savings. So it should be very, very, um, Simple. Now, let me just guide you very uh, shortly through the approach we have taken in the Czech Republic. Is what mentioned that uh, the light pollution issue was uh, also solved uh, before 20 years, but the new era started in 2017 when interministerial working group on light pollution was set, and we have produced the first information to the government and also our first lighting manual for municipalities as a main recipient. We also adjusted subsidy schemes uh, because so far they only oriented um, the funding through the most efficient solutions. And we uh, added also uh, additional parameters to 
think about light pollution. So uh, we set um, the parameter of uh, correlated color temperature for 2700 and also uh, the direction of light to lower hemisphere. And also while you know, uh, setting the projects uh, according to current standards, uh, not to exceed uh, the limits, uh, not more than, than 30%. We also adjusted our Nature and Landscape Protection Act. We added uh, explicit uh, mention uh, not to place uh, open lines uh, in natural parks. We also worked a lot on uh, you know, awareness raising. Uh, we have conducted two international webinars because it was the time of COVID. Uh, one of it uh, took place uh, within EU Green Week because the main topic of the Green Week in 2021 was uh, zero pollution. We also uh, drafted special manual for authorized persons when uh, they are, you know, elaborating environmental impact assessments. Um, and also, very importantly, we have launched research projects uh, called Influence of Light Pollution on Sensitive Animal Species, Ecosystems and the Landscape in Czechia to have better information and a better data uh, in the view that we would like to adjust our national legislation further. And right now we are uh, working or the Technical Commission is working on special technical standard to be able to better address uh, light pollution through standardization. And we would like to involve the parameters also in our new building act and decree, which will come into power next year. So the work is ongoing, and I really hope that uh, also the experiences from other countries will enrich uh, the, the thing we are doing here in Czechia. And what about the European level? Of course, I will talk once again about the problem recognition. Uh, it's very important to realize the impacts uh, and the effects uh, artificial light at night has. Also, it's a transboundary issue. When the member states will be able to address the issue, we would be also able to address this issue once it is transboundary or, you know, preventing that the issue will become transboundary. Mutual learning, that's evident, and uh, monitoring, which is very important because when we would like to regulate something, we really need the good data. And as it was said, so maybe the solution is simple. Uh, and these three principles are also embedded in uh, our conclusions. We have drafted uh, this working paper, Light Pollution Reduction Measures in Europe, and I would like to thank everyone who participated and um, we received comments from different member states adjusting uh, the information. So we really think it's valuable uh, background paper for further work. And you can see that uh, almost all countries has some measures taking in place. They are front runners who has already legislation, uh, as uh, France was mentioned, they have the newest one. Then there are countries that are actually, you know, adjusting the old legislation. We also have standards column there, but I think it's only Czechia and Austria who actually drafted uh, national national standards. We have also awareness raising, but we have also other column which uh, where we looked for other document research projects, but also, for example, if there are any dark sky um, areas in the, in, the, in the country. So I hope uh, you have the working document and we will also present it to, to the council as one of the um, outcomes. And what's our call for European concerted action in Brno Appeal? And thank you once again for your input. Uh, to those conclusions. So the clues are surrounding different topics. Firstly, um, take light pollution in environmental policies and legislation. Also, we should be able to use available permitting and assessment procedures and instruments. Also, we need to review available lighting standards and initiate more new 
if, if, if needed, uh, according to different um, uh, different areas of public concern. We also have to explore the control mechanism, dimming, and also maybe adjust funding support, because if you have the funding scheme only oriented in energy efficiency, you really may contribute through the project to production of uh, light pollution, which is not necessary. Also, we do have involved uh, green public procurement criteria they are really good, uh, but still I think uh, the context is evolving, so we may also take once again to look what it's uh, already drafted and uh, review it from the actual uh, point of view. Also eco-design, there are different waves of revision of eco-design and uh, when it comes to requirements for light sources, uh, we should be also able to review it with uh, the stress or you know, lifting up the issue of light pollution and the effect on biodiversity. Research projects, they are needed because uh, we need more information and also indicators and monitoring. And of course, awareness raising until we have some system regulation in place. And I will once again talk about synergistic effects because uh, those are the cities uh, who joined Earth Hour. Earth Hour every March is to support climate measures. And we can truly see that there are synergies between climate protection policies, biodiversity protection policies, energy efficiency policies, uh, by managing our outdoor, outdoor lighting visor. So thank you very much and uh, looking forward to your question if you do have it. Thank you very much, Mrs. Paskova. Let's see whether there are any questions, maybe from the audience. There is, a, there is a gentleman raising his hand. And yours, um, also your name, please. I'm Piero Benvenuti. I'm representing the International Astronomical Union here. The first thing I want to praise the Czech Republic for taking such a strong action particularly now that you have the presidency of the council to impose legislation on light pollution. And certainly it's been indicated one of the measures that uh, people think that are the most effective to protect or to reduce light pollution. However, this may be true in an ideal world, but once you have the legislation, the real problem is to uh, imposing it and controlling. I'm living in the Veneto region and you would see that I, Veneto region has a legislation since many years, very strong, very, very about light pollution. But if you see the pictures, Veneto is one of the most uh, polluted area in Europe. It may just appear with, with, uh, with Belgium. So, uh, and the problem is really to identify the, uh, who is uh, polluting and control that. So uh, certainly is, a, is an avenue that has to be per, uh, used, but is not the only one. And I just want to um, uh, say that there might be another tool which is becoming effective uh, protecting the sky from another attack, which is currently very serious from the International Astronomical Union, and that is the interference by the uh, constellation of communication satellites. As you may know, in a few years there will be 100,000 satellites in low Earth orbit, and the observation of the of astronomical observation, but also the vision of the sky will be completely subverted. Now, our approach, the IAU approach, initially was to consider about trying to find regulation at the international level, uh, at the level of the UN Committee for the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. However, we soon realized that it will be very difficult to obtain agreement. And so we decided to go another avenue, which is to uh, collaborate with industries that are launching the satellite and make them responsible for the damage that they are doing so that they have to react and try to mitigate their impact. So my suggestion would be to consider who is making money with lights. These are the industries that are producing uh, uh, light features. And if you succeed in making them responsible for the pollution, that you touch them on the money. 
And so they may, may become responsible and uh, produce lighting systems which are less impacting on light pollution. So it's just a suggestion, but I think one has to consider and also uh, um, uh, express this view to all our countries and, and, and see if that, because if that is succeeded, then is a very uh, effective way of trying to produce the light pollution. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I may, a uh, short comment. Thank you very much for rising up uh, the other issue of satellites. And I think that's the problem of protecting our commons. You know, we can see it on the oceans. Uh, we are not able to reach agreement. Uh, we will have another uh, summit on climate protection coming next. So I think uh, the global solution is uh, very not an easy task, but we are still striving for it. And. Uh, as you mentioned, the producers of uh, lighting sources, I, I do agree it's one of the possible measures. But at the same time, I think we would be stronger in you know, appealing at uh, those producers when we would do it as a European Union or more member states because uh, usually those are also like international companies, big companies. So I think if we may send a message together, it would be much more uh, impactful. Thank you very much for the question and for the answer. Uh, although the time's up, may I ask you to maybe take the two remaining questions at once, because they all, or but they both touch uh, the ministry's work with uh, light pollution. So just a short comment, please. Okay, what's the biggest success and achievement so far? Well, I think this is achievement, right? Uh, so, and uh, we are not, uh, you know, stopping uh, at this, uh, uh, achievement and we would go further and of course we have a lot of work to do at our national uh, national scope uh, to tackle the problem and how large is the problem of light pollution in the ministry uh, well I would like to thank Helena who is the spirit of the light pollution and also other colleagues but uh, to be honest um, we do what we can with uh, one colleague working on <laughs> this agenda and not only on this agenda but uh, we see it as emerging concern and issue, so therefore we are really dedicated to solve it, also together with colleagues from biodiversity protection and climate protection. May I add that we are trying to be as loud as possible in the ministry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mrs. Paskova. Before the first panel discussion, we've got one more uh, speaker, which I would like to invite to come join me here, please. And it is Mr. Joachim De Eugenio uh, from the European Commission. Thank you very much, Helena. Um, how much time do I still have? Because my time is normally up yet now. <laughs> ah, good. There's a timer there. Perfect. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation uh, to the presidency of the ministry, to beautiful Bruno. Unfortunately, although it's light outside, we're here in the, in the darkness. Hopefully we can see more of Bruno a bit later. I think we will. Uh, this uh, event comes at a great time, at a very good time. I think you chose, um, chose the uh, topic and the, the, uh, the timing very, very well. Uh, I will give you a short uh, run through what is happening at the European level, but I cannot... Uh, a start without making a reference to what I've heard already from the great presentations about Belgium. I want to tell you a little little anecdote. Uh, well, anecdote, it's not so so funny in a way, but I was really shocked when I moved to Belgium, because I live in Brussels, uh, that you basically, you come from Germany, from the motorway, and you drive into Belgium, and the boat motorways were lit. Really bright light, as, as if it was day. You, you could turn the car light off, because it was really all the way through. So not only at the exits, so all the way through. I said, what's going on here? So as brief, I was quickly explained is that Belgium has so much energy from the nuclear power plants that they don't know what to do with it at night. Well, this is 20 years ago. And if I'm telling you this story today, I think it at least brings a chill down my spine. They have turned off the light of, not on the motorway in the meantime. But these are, these are difficult times that we have. And en energy is and will increasingly become a luxury commodity. Not only because we are in a really terrible crisis at the moment, but I think the, 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 tra the trajectory is clear that we will have to think twice before using energy. So talking about the subject makes a lot of sense for many, many 
angles, and, and you've already alluded a lot of them in, in the presentation. So again, uh, very well done on putting this on the agenda. Um, on the European level, as you know, uh, the Commission 2019, the President has launched uh, the European Green Deal. And I could now spend all my 20 minutes on this slide because there are so many things going on and there is a link in one way or another uh, to light pollution in, in many of these uh, strategies and initiatives that we're taking in relation to climate change, biodiversity, uh, buildings, for example. But I want to focus today on the zero pollution uh, ambition for a toxic free environment. In particular, because when then translating the Green Deal into something, uh, let's say that the, not only the Commission is putting forward as a, as a, as a policy strategy, but that we wanted to, the uh, European Union to unite around, uh, we prepared a, 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 a proposal that was called uh, the Eighth Environmental Action Programme. And that is a legal act that is being discussed in the Council by all Member States and in the European Parliament. So it's not only the European Commission, but it's all the legislative institutions of the EU have agreed on the Eighth Environmental Action Programme. And if you look there in the, in the text uh, on zero pollution, on the ambition for uh, 2050 that the vision is in the Eighth Environmental Action Programme, and the priority objectives for 2030, you will find light pollution mentioned as being part of the ambition that the EU wants to tackle. We have translated the zero pollution ambition in a concrete um, kind of long-term objective, uh, defining it now in something that uh, we say that air, water and soil pollution is reduced to a level that no longer harms the health and the natural ecosystems and that respects the boundaries of, the, of, uh, the, of, the planet, of our planet, basically. And I think that definition is universal for all types of pollution. It's a very large ambition. It's questioned sometimes, can we really achieve it? But I want to say for us it is important that it is a perspective. It's a long-term uh, traffic sign. This is the road we want to go to. And then of course we have to translate this into concrete, what that means for the different types of pollution that we're talking about. Today we can discuss this topic in, in the context of light pollution. That's very interesting then to hear. I cannot um, uh, not mention something which is unrelated to light pollution because it happened today. Uh, so we have set out in this action plan on zero pollution, we have set out a number of actions in the area of health, uh, biodiversity and uh, circular economy. And today uh, the European Commission, less than, than one and a half hours ago, adopted uh, one of the major packages in this, in this action plan. So we have just uh, been uh, announcing new rules on uh, air quality, new rules on, on water pollutants and on new uh, wastewater treatment plants. So check this out if you're interested in pollution more widely. I think there is really a lot uh, of, of new, interesting and ambitious ideas that, uh, that are now on the table and that will be discussed uh, in, in, in the European Union in the, in the coming month. And I know that the presidency is already planning to discuss them in the next European uh, Environment Council. On light pollution, in the same action plan, we have basically said we need to better understand the scale and the extent of the problem and also look at uh, questions of uh, uh, monitoring that was mentioned, what is the European scale uh, uh, problem. And so we have uh, introduced as an action, as a, as, a, as, a, as a project that we are now working on, which is the Zero Pollution Monitoring uh, and Outlook Report. And uh, in that context, uh, we're also looking at the question of light pollution. Again, timing of this event here is perfect for this work that we're doing because uh, the European Environment Agency and with uh, the help of the European Topic Center for Health and Environment uh, has looked into this in more detail. I'm very happy that Kaya is here today. I think in one of the later sessions, she will present this work in more detail. So I will not uh, explain or, or, uh, or reveal uh, the results in detail, but that's the work that they have done and that will feed into our zero pollution monitoring and outlook. So let's run through uh, very quickly into the few areas of um, policies that already exist and where already light pollution is addressed uh, and, and can be tackled with, uh, with EU laws. Uh, I've clustered them a little bit into five groups that I will then go into a little bit more detail um, later. On one hand, uh, biodiversity type uh, related actions. Uh, we have uh, the strategy for 2030 that now, of course, is our compass uh, to go to the, uh, to the uh, global level, to the UN conference of the parties uh, that is taking place in Montreal in December. 
Um, but from a EU level point of view, we have introduced targets that, for instance, also look at, uh, and, uh, and Anna mentioned it earlier in her presentation, look at uh, achieving certain level of favorable status for the birds and habitats directives. Uh, we are also in this context working on pollinators, say a few words on this. There is, of course, uh, uh, legislation in place uh, for new projects, plans and programs, the so-called impact assessment, environment impact assessment, or strategic environment assessment directives. We have a lot of work on NFG efficiency co-design, and I will say a few words on, on what is ongoing there. Uh, green public procure procurement. Uh, is another area where, of course, uh, administrations can pick up these uh, recommendations that exist and guidelines that exist in this area and, and translate them into their, into their daily practice. And last but not least, and I will not say more in detail because it is, um, um, it is not more to say than what I have here on that uh, slide, is there is a very powerful, I think, a very powerful instrument is called uh, the Sustainable Finance Regulation or the so-called Taxonomy Regulation where there are basically uh, rules being established for the financial sector to how the, they can claim that a certain investment is environmental friendly, is green, is climate friendly and so on. And these rules are being developed. There have been some rules already agreed in, re in relation to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we're working at the moment on rules to classify financial investments also in relation to pollution. And light pollution is one of the uh, uh, dimensions that is included in that. And of course, it would be fantastic if the financial sector would have some form of judgment be able to do to say this investment would be better to reduce pollution, also light pollution, than the other. And that's something that you also probably um, you know, uh, we can discuss in more detail how we can use that, that incentive uh, in the future. Let's go a little bit into more detail on uh, the biodiversity because I think there is a lot of uh, work going on. Uh, what is very important that I want to mention is that uh, as part of the overall assessment of favorable, uh, favorable conservation status of setting out nature protect protection areas, it is mandatory to make an assessment what are the threats, what are the reasons, the pressures that cause the species or the habitats not achieving favorable conservation status because they're all very different and the mix of these pressures is different. So it's very much up to the member state to then assess why in this case, for instance, in relation to nocturnal species, we have a problem. And there light pollution does play a role. And I want to say here as a main message is what we find surprising, in particular after the very nice overview that we heard from the, from the Czech colleagues, from the Czech presidency, is that no member states has reported to us that light pollution is a problem. So that's something we would like to find out more from the experts in the different countries uh, to better understand why on one hand there seems to be a general recognition that we have this problem, but when it comes to application of the law, this problem is either not found or if it is found, it is not reported to us. I mean, there may be reasons why that happens, but we would like to understand it better. But certainly what we are highlighting, what we want to highlight is it is possible and it should be done that where the light pollution causes a significant effect that does not allow achieving the conservation status that is in the directives, um, that needs to be addressed. That is a very, very important message. We are also working in the context of uh, pollinators. It is clearly a concern. Light pollution is clearly a concern for pollinators, as, as was already mentioned. Uh, there was a workshop uh, that colleagues did uh, earlier this year uh, in relation to the preparation of a revision of a new EU pollinators initiative. As you can see at the end there, it's coming out by the end of the year. And we have already been able to publish a number of um, guidelines for citizens, for uh, businesses that make recommendations on how to address uh, light pollution that affects pollinators. So I think there is already uh, an important resource that uh, we want to recommend and that we want to promote. In the context of uh, impact assessments, again, uh, in a new project, for example, that has been designed, it is even explicitly mentioned in the, in the directive, in the annex, that these projects need to be assessed in the relation to the consequences that the light pollution has for the environment, be it health, be it, uh, be it, uh, be it biodiversity, etc. 
So again, here there's two directives because the one focuses on projects, the other one on plans and programs. We believe there is a lot of scope already within existing laws to be able to address uh, the issues that we're discussing in this meeting. Uh, then a topic where I must say I have um, been positively surprised. Uh, this is input from a, non, a large number of colleagues uh, that I've received in, in the run-up to the workshop. And in particular, my colleagues in DG Energy got very excited when they heard about the workshop because they said, well, this is wonderful because, of course, as was mentioned, there is now scope that we want to reduce energy use from, uh, uh, from, from light as part also of our energy efficiency drive and energy, energy efficiency principle or the principle of energy efficiency first is something that, that we are promoting uh, across the board. Now, what is uh, interesting or what I learned was interesting that uh, within the energy efficiency directive that we have proposed and that is still under finalization, there are also targets for public bodies to reduce annually uh, their energy consumption. So it's not only light pollution, but in, ge in general to say each uh, public administration should reduce by, I think it's 1.7%, I was told, uh, the energy consumption uh, to make a contribution to the overall energy savings. And the colleagues calculated that light plays a significant part of the energy consumption and is a significant, uh, uh, poses significant opportunities to save energy. Yeah, so I think some of the examples that we've seen here would immediately feed into achieving such, uh, such an ambitious target, which, uh, of course, can be done in different ways. It is, however, not, that I wanted to underline, is, however, not for us in Brussels at the European level to say the one-size-fits-all solution, to say each city, each region has to do exactly this, has to turn, out, uh, turn off all the lights on um, cultural buildings, for example. It's not for us to decide. These are local decisions. This is not uh, something that can be harmonized across the EU. And that is why we have to find this interplay. We're saying we want to have the goal of reducing energy consumption. We want to have the goal of reducing light pollution. But how precisely it's done, what is the mix, what are the best solutions, have to be decided at the local level. It has to go hand in hand. And I think that's a very important message I also want to, want to pass on. I, uh, one thing I want to mention here as well, found it's very interesting if you're not aware, uh, that a lot of uh, examples uh, are already being promoted, good practices, and the con con covenant of uh, mayors is running a, a, an activity that's called the energy saving sprint, and public lighting is one of their four priority areas. So that is something that, there's, if you look in there, there's quite a lot of uh, interesting uh, examples from some cities in there, where I think that could feed into, into our debate. Um, a few words on products. On one hand, uh, was already mentioned the um, Eco-Design Directive. There is a new work program, work plan until 2024, where there's a number, if you look in there, a number of uh, products, uh, lighting products uh, that will be uh, reviewed and the, the energy efficiency will be, uh, will be discussed. There is a directive uh, called the Low Voltage Directive, which sets standards for lighting equipment, amongst others, the other equipment as well. Um, and there are some standards, I, uh, listed the numbers here um, that, that, are, that are looking also at the health effects of these uh, lighting products. Admittedly, I think more could be done in these areas to bring in the science that we have now, the emerging science, to these standardization processes. What I wanted to highlight here um, mainly is that the, the legal frameworks exist and in the translation of these legal frameworks into concrete products, into concrete standards, we now have to feed in the different evidence that we have from, from, from the work that you're doing. Uh, and last but certainly not least, I mentioned already uh, green public procurement. We've developed uh, criteria for uh, road lighting, for traffic signals and, and recommendations in this respect. And this is, of course, very useful if uh, public authorities use these uh, uh, procurement guidelines when purchasing new street lighting, for example. Uh, now I want to finish off with a few words on research. Uh, I think it is uh, clear that more uh, work is needed. There is a lot of research going on, um, but I want to um, just show you a few examples. You will see the slides later, then you can look up in more detail uh, these, these various projects. This is a selection. It's not, not all of the things that are ongoing. But what I wanted to uh, finish off is to uh, 
make you an early announcement, so to say, and, and, and a sneak preview because it is not formally decided. You see here that it's due to be decided by the Commission in uh, December. And if the Commission follows what uh, currently is being discussed, um, but I thought it's a good audience here to already uh, give that, that uh, information, uh, keep it for yourselves, but I mean, still. Uh, there will be work um, continuing in terms of uh, health impacts. There's a, there's a very successful so-called Europe, European Human Exposome Network that looks at all sorts of uh, environmental uh, threats and exposures um, and, and, and the link to non-communicable diseases. And my understanding is that they also would like to do more on looking at the, the contribution of the overall environmental health, uh, the environmental effect on health. Uh, from light pollution and on the biodiversity side again uh, there is the intention to to do uh, well to have a call in the work program that would include uh, research on the link to biodiversity impacts to light and also noise pollution so with that i would like to conclude by saying it is an issue that is receiving more and more attention at the european level i think this con this conference this workshop here is only one element uh, it is coming up in, in many many different contexts um, there is already a lot we can do together yeah so i would encourage everybody to 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 use the possibilities that already exist um, and uh, of course see if there are obstacles of why they are not used we are happy to help and unblock these situations uh, but i think we also need to work together in uh, increasing the evidence base and better understand the scale, the impact at the European level of, uh, of, of light pollution. And, and for that, uh, I think we will be certainly learning more in the course of the day. Uh, and we will be uh, doing this in the context of our zero pollution monitoring and outlook that will be presented for the first time in December. And I close by inviting you to join the conference that we have planned to hold on the 14th of December to present and discuss uh, the as a pollution monitoring and outlook. I can already say is it will not be about light pollution alone or not as much as you would like probably uh, because we will co be covering all, all types of pollution but I think it's a forum that we need to bring these topics in and you can watch this uh, event uh, online as well and there are a few places still available also in Brussels. So thank you very much, I'll stop here and if there are any questions, happy to do so. Thank you very much, Joachim, for the message from the European Commission, including this first-hand information. We appreciate it. I have already seen uh, a raised hand there for a question. May, may, um, hi, I'm Alejandro Sanchez from the Complutense University in Madrid. Um, I don't know how hard it will be to answer this question. Um, how likely it would be that European funds don't go against the green public procurement uh, policy? You know? Because we see that a lot of funds from the recovery are sent to the countries and are used to street lighting, but don't follow the European regulations. So it's a recommendation. So it's a bit an inefficient in then then we send funds to the Natura 2000 network to recover those things that were damaged by European funds. So easy solution would be force the countries to follow the recommendations for European funds, not for local funds, for local funds they could do whatever they want, but with European funds follow the green procurement uh, policy. I don't know how, how do, difficult would be do, to do that. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I mean, recommendations are by nature recommendations and law. So in that sense, it's a, it's a first question is, do we want to force or not force? I mean, recommendations, we appeal to the common sense of the national administrations to then follow them. But uh, green public procurement, if you refer to those guidelines, are in their current state, at least, uh, recommendations. So it is also difficult for us to then enforce them in the classical sense. I think what um, is, of course, clear, and I think for me, it's uh, for, we have always done that, but I think there has been a renewed and strengthened emphasis on something that is now being highlighted. I think, Anna, you had it on one of your slides, is the do no harm principle. 
So there's a lot of discussions going on about the use of the funds and what impacts they have. Of course, the dilemma is always uh, twofold. So first of all, we are discussing an enormous amount of money at a level where we're not looking at a local specific small project impact. So we are maybe discussing the whole X billion that uh, Spain is getting yeah, and how they overall are used. But we cannot then not at this stage already understand because also national authorities haven't told us precisely how this X billion are being used a few hundred thousand in one particular site, in one particular place. So I think that will be something to follow through as we go along. Um, we have, of course, when it comes to uh, nature protection, we have, of course, the laws in place. And there's a principle that EU funds, where there is a, a demonstration that the EU law is broken, are being blocked. I mean, there's several infringement procedures I'm aware of that their EU funds are not being able to be released, although they have been discussed and agreed in general, because there was a documentation and uh, a breach of law, either because the European Commission has started an infringement procedure or there's a, there's a, there's a dispute at national level. So it's not an easy uh, topic because it really is these different layers, but we have a number of mechanisms in place and we are now at the moment at the early stage of the financing cycle. So member states decide the strategies, how they want to use uh, the money for the next couple of years. Uh, I know, for instance, before I left, we were discussing the agricultural funds in different areas for different countries. So the funds are being released now in general terms, but I call on you and everybody to now help the national authorities in implementing those funds in such a way that they follow the rules and the guidelines that we have at the European level. We, can, we certainly cannot do this alone, but that's uh, certainly something we will aspire to do, is to make sure that this is done, this do no harm principle is applied in the best possible way. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question and the answer. I would love to hear more questions, more answers, and we certainly have questions incoming for which we thank. Would you like to take one more and answer, like really, sh really briefly? From the ones on the screen. From the ones on the screen, yeah. Which one? <laughs> yes, the the one that will be most briefly <laughs> answered. Yeah, I mean, I think that these questions. I'm not 100% sure I fully understand it, but if I take the last one on energy consumption is, uh, is not the best way to address light pollution. I think these are really questions where it, it is important that the experts uh, get involved in, for instance, discussions like on eco-design or on, uh, uh, on, on, on a low voltage directive because the standardization setting, because I think my um, impression from a reading in the preparation of the meeting from, from colleagues is that so far the, the awareness is limited on the topic of light pollution and that expertise is also needed for them to be able to translate that into the, into the process that are ongoing. So my advice on this, but I think also on some of the other questions is I think your expertise needed is in these processes and the time is right to get involved. And as I explained in my slides, there are quite a number of areas where you can get involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joachim. Let's, uh, let's now <laughs> get to... Let's get into the first discussion before, before our coffee break. I would like to ask the first panelists to come join me here in the front. Mr. Damir Bartolic from Croatia, Mr. David Smith from the UK, and also Mr. Gunther Wuchtel from Austria. We were supposed to have a fourth panelist who would have um, connected online. Unfortunately, he won't be able to make it.
And I also, I also welcome uh, our uh, moderator, Mrs. Paskova, again. Yeah. We split the moderation, so now it will be with me. And thank you, Helena, for guiding us through the first part. And uh, since we are learning a little bit late, I would uh, like to ask uh, the presenters to really stick to the seven minutes so we have uh, uh, space for, for question. I mean, uh, as we are only, we have only three panelists, it helps a little bit. So I would like to ask um, our uh, cherished host, uh, Mr. Damir Bartolic from the Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development to, for the first uh, speech and presentation. Please take the hand, a microphone, which is in front of you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Damir. I'm a senior expert advisor with the Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development. You can see my uh, presentation over here. I'm going to try to withhold within the seven minutes. So I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, where's the? Yeah. OK. Sweet. Thank you. So allow me to provide you with a, a short Ah, yeah. Allow me to provide with a short overview of the circumstances in which Croatia has designed, adopted and failed to enforce the first act on protection against light pollution. Uh, because of the seasonal inflow of tourists, uh, Croatia, um, which result in high peaks of energy consumption during the summer and driven by the recession in 2006 uh, till 2016, 2008 to, till 2016, uh, there were uh, elaborate options for uh, reductions in energy consumption, especially electricity, but uh, other en energies as well. So that forced the ministry to devise the first act on uh, light pollution. And uh, the major emphasis uh, was on uh, energy consumption reductions, but also tried to um, define the lighting methods and determining lighting management standards. However, it failed to take root because um, the terminology was ambiguous and uh, the ordinances which were prescribed by the law were not uh, drafted uh, or neither were uh, uh, placed in force. So, whoops, wrong one, sorry. Um, oh yeah, the other, the other side. Wrong side. Okay, so to circumvent this administrative uh, ambiguity, uh, the minister came up with the rough idea of how the uh, act should look like. Uh, we had uh, um, we had some idea about how the structure should be uh, placed, but we actually uh, approached the, the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing for technical assistance, and uh, we used the old uh, uh, legislation as a basis, and then we brought up with uh, a, a proposal draft, which was then presented to the members of the working group, you can see the members are from different uh, areas and also were presented by the administrative bodies. Um, during the meeting, there were f really s fierce tensions between two newly formed groups within the, within the working group, uh, one representing the industry and the other ones representing the environment. And uh, it, became, it came to the point where it, we had to end the meeting and asked everybody to comment uh, in track changes on the proposal of the draft. And we have conducted the uh, communication uh, strictly through email. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the last meeting was actually uh, held in, in, in person uh, just to polish off a few things. Um, the issues were that the people that were representing environment were not really very technical regarding the planning and uh, uh, technology uh, when it comes to public uh, lighting plans. So the remaining procedures were just public consultations and ad administrative consultations. And I would, would like to mention that few of the members of the public were actually quite resourceful in uh, offering us some good uh, solutions. Uh, the act came into force, whoops. Sorry. The act came into force in 2014, in April, and it stated uh, three ordinances which ministry had to uh, implement and draft. Uh, they define in detail matters regarding illumination zones, limit values, responsibilities, structures of lighting plans, action plans, who, how, why measures, monitors light pollution. Pretty much it creates comprehensive uh, framework for protection, for protection against light pollution. Here you can see a short organogram uh, uh, regarding our leg legislation. Everything in blue is in force, and the two remaining ordinances will come into force in November 
in the end of November 2022, if not by the end of the year of 2022. Uh, but we'll see how that works. We still have some frictions with the Ministry of uh, Spatial Planning and Construction regarding the two remaining. Okay, moving on. So the Act provides exemptions, and the exemptions are usually uh, regarding the energy facilities, military installation, security installation, traffic signalization within the air traffic, uh, ports, and railway. And uh, we also have um, uh, limitations, prohibitions, and exemptions regarding the light beams, which are forbidden to be pointed towards the sky or natural bodies of water, the openings of the buildings, uh, there's a definition of acceptably, acceptable lamps, uh, direction of the light beams have to uh, move um, in line with the horizon, uh, illumination billboards and big screens also have limitations. There is a set CCT for lamps which are acceptable and also with the ordinance there is a G index which actually limits the amount of blue light which is acceptable for these lamps. Uh, moving on. So the ordinance on zones of illumination or lighting zones, uh, we actually stumbled upon the uh, guidance from the UK uh, government side and we've actually implemented the zoning which was suggested there in our own legislation. Um, previously rec recognized zones were uh, actually made sense to us so we have adopted it in the legislation. Whoops. Let's see, oh yeah, this one. Sorry, I'm a little bit clumsy. Uh, here you can so see the zoning, which are uh, defined by the ordinance and lighting zones. Uh, they are, come with uh, circumstances which are relevant for each zone. Uh, one column is missing, but it's not important. It's really uh, more detailed definition of the each zone. You see the E0, E0 zone is a night, a night illumination, uh, which is like dark skies. E1 is dark landscape areas, such as rural areas, areas of low ambient values, such as villages, uh, areas of uh, medium ambient illumination, suburban areas, and you have E4 areas with high ambient illumination such as uh, cinemas, shopping malls, somewhere where there is a high intensity of nightlife. Uh, here are a uh, few examples of how the ordinances prescribes limit values, and limit values um, are very elaborate, but just to mention a few of them, it, they regard illumination of decorative lighting, uh, landscape illumination, natural bodies of water, bridges, overpasses, viaducts, billboards, digital ad advertising screens such as big screens, sport areas and playgrounds, uh, radiuses, around protect, uh, radiuses around the uh, observatories. Um, the ordinance on the content format and uh, drafting of the lighting plan is something that uh, is to be adopted uh, to avoid hindering the development of municipalities, cities and towns. It was actually agreed that the, their, all, their responsibility, uh, their own, their are, they are responsible for their own spatial planning. So the spatial plans are the input data for um, our uh, lighting zones and uh, lighting plans. Moving on. This is the trial uh, lighting plan which um, ministry has actually um, through the tender um, tried to make. Uh, three spatial planning companies applied. Uh, we have accepted the one which was with the most affordable offer, and it helped us to tune up a few of the issues which were uh, found within the ordinance. And last ordinance is the one on the measurement uh, of environmental lighting or illumination. It will define the methods of measuring the environmental, lumin environmental luminance. It will provide the legislative framework uh, for getting validate, validated measurements uh, from real time, from, from the field, and it will be done by accredited companies, and the accreditation will be issued by Creation Accreditation Agency to any company that uh, applies and fulfills requirements according to ISO 70025 standard. And that, that would be all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damir. And now we will hear, hear from uh, the experiences uh, from UK, from David Smith, from Bug Life. Hi, thank you ever so much for uh, having us here today. And it's uh, a pleasure to be here representing Bug Life. We are a UK-based NGO, um, although we operate across Europe uh, to protect, conserve, and restore invertebrate populations 
And we do this through direct conservation, on the ground habitat restoration, through social change, making people uh, become more aware and have friendly relationship with invertebrates and insects, and also through influencing policy and legislation. So why light pollution? We are all here, we all, we all pretty much know, but I really wanted to, to touch upon this and, and talk about the significance from the aspect of all invertebrates, not just the uh, traditional ones you may think of, such as pollinators and the flying invertebrates. Um, it's thought that up to 150,000 species of invertebrate uh, may go extinct within the next 30 years. So that's a, a colossal number. Um, and the drivers of this um, are, pretty much from all stresses all across the board, but key drivers being habitat loss and from pollution. And with around two thirds of invertebrates being either wholly or partially active at night, obviously any, uh, any pollutant that is uh, restricted mainly to night is gonna be a significant one to, to tackle. Um, but not only that, we're also seeing that the impact of artificial light is having on daytime species as well, extending the length of the day. Um, so it's, it's pretty much safe to say that every species that has been studied with regards to the impact of light pollution are shown some sort of change, whether that be through behavioral change or physiological change or directly as a, a cause of death. Light pollution is a significant driver of insect invertebrate decline and must be recognized and addressed in a much uh, stronger way than has been to date. Um, and just to touch upon some of those uh, those species that extend beyond pollinators, whilst uh, extremely important, um, and the, uh, the, the the night flying species, uh, we're also seeing the impacts uh, in aquatic invertebrates, in terrestrial invertebrates as well. So we have species such as zooplankton, Daphnia, which are the building blocks of life in our oceans and waterways. Uh, exposure to artificial light can suppress their development um, and potentially lead to uh, lower populations of them those which uh, can obviously have a, a knock-on effect um, up the food chain. Iconic species such as, as glowworms um, have been shown to be impacted by a single LED. If you can imagine a, a glowworm glowing, it's, uh, it's not too far dissimilar to a, a single LED. And, and, um, and, and light pollution impacts their ability to attract prey and to attract uh, mates, um, and is fundamentally leading to their declines. And then also some of the terrestrial species, gastropods, uh, such as snails and slugs, um, important decomposers in our, in our world, are being drawn away from optimal habitats towards uh, those that are artificially lit, which can increase predation, but also uh, lead to them finding themselves in, in really suboptimal habitats with, with harsh consequences from chemicals and, um, and temperature changes. So for us, light pollution must be addressed. It must be addressed as an environmental pollutant um, and... Uh, Here's how we're, we're trying to do this. Um, so uh, as well as creating social awareness um, of the issue, we also are really trying to drive uh, environmental targets with regards to light pollution. Um, in the UK, whilst uh, we have uh, a number of legislations uh, that looks at light pollution, none of them are fit for purpose for addressing the impact on the environment and biodiversity. So it's, uh, it's something that must be updated and we can't rest on uh, those pieces of legislation that we have in place with regards to light pollution. It needs to be elevated up to an environmental pollutant. Uh, guidance, whilst uh, very useful and part of the picture, it relies on effective installation and use. Um, and in many cases, the environment uh, isn't uh, considered um, as greatly as the impact is on people. And of course, voluntary action is part of the solution. However, we do worry that that could lead to habitat fragmentation, creating of dark islands, uh, which, which isn't ideal for species that are under pressure through changes uh, as a result of climate change and the need to move about. So why targets? Well, targets um, are required to improve the environment. They are recognized as a, a way of approaching pollution and reducing the impacts of pollution. So it's, uh, it's something that already exists, frameworks already exist. It's a really effective way of monitoring pollution, not only to monitor the impacts, but also to monitor the initiatives that we have to actually create change. And also it can drive action by successive governments, um, which allows for sec uh, scrutiny and accountability um, and ensures that the issue doesn't get forgotten. Uh, and without those targets, we, we often see warm words that get forgotten and, and pushed aside. So this is where we're really, really pushing on that um, uh, aspect of legislation. 
And we've had a really good go at this in the UK recently, uh, in uh, just last year, the Environment Act was passed. Um, this is a landmark piece of legislation for the UK, which sets out a legally binding target or targets for the government to improve, restore nature and biodiversity. Um, it creates a, a framework, essentially, um, of targets in order to improve the, the natural world, as well as an improvement plan uh, in the way to reach those targets. Uh, on the face of the bill, there was no mention of light pollution, so we looked to uh, put forward an amendment, which we're pleased to say was uh, put forward in our upper chamber in the House of Lords. It received uh, a widespread support and uh, was covered in a, in a number of debates. A very simple change, literally two words, would have changed the entire course of action on, uh, on light pollution. Um, however, fundamentally, despite the support across party, it was rejected by the government uh, on the grounds that they didn't want to be prescriptive in the number of pollutants listed on the face of the bill. They believed this could be picked up in other places. However, um, as we point out and, and has been mentioned before, light pollution is often forgotten. It is still considered a emerging concern. We do not believe this to be the case and we believe that actually action is required to drive this forward. So in having light on the face of the bill, we would have been able to achieve this. All is not lost, however. Um, as I mentioned, the law does create a framework for uh, secondary legislation to set uh, shorter term targets, um, which we will continue to push for um, and, and put forward. So we are expecting uh, those uh, the first uh, tranche of those targets to be announced or confirmed uh, relatively soon. Um, but if not, we will continue to have stabs at those in, in the years going forward. And also the environment and improvement plan will be reviewed on a, an annual basis. And we we will continue to push for uh, light pollution to be uh, included and set out how they, uh, the government intends to tackle this problem there. However, that does run the risk of being pushed into uh, soft policy and, and us not being able to hold the government uh, account. And with 10 seconds to spare, that's, uh, that's that from me. But if anyone wants to uh, discuss anything and hear further, then yeah, very happy to discuss uh, the situation in the UK, but also uh, the impact on invertebrates. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. And now we move to our third panelist, uh, Mr. Günther Wuchterle, chair of the Kufner Observatory in Austria. Yeah, welcome everybody and uh, many thanks for the opportunity to speak here in Bruno. Uh, I will talk about standards, which is a kind of paradox but uh, let me start with one standard that I've taken from Bruno. That's my, my take on the question of the definition of light pollution. And uh, I have gotten it from Jan Holland, who made it very simple. His definition is that light pollution is light, artificial light, introduced into the environment by humans. And we can discuss how much is acceptable for our civilization, how much is acceptable for the species at night. That's the first introductory statement I want to make. The second one is that um, there was a solar eclipse yesterday, a partial solar eclipse, and uh, the sun went down by about 30% or so in light. Many people didn't notice at all. <laughs> and what we have for the habitat at night is not a 30%. We change the night habitat by a factor of 1,000. One to 1,000. That's the change in light level. If we go back to the sun, we don't get a solar impact of a kilowatt per square meter outside the atmosphere or so, but a megawatt per square meter which uh, on some of the crisis problems would be nice, but who wants to live under a megawatt per square meter? Uh, the mother of all sunburns. So having said that, let me talk about the Austrian standards that you uh, came or invited me to hear. It's paradox that I talk about standard, but it's, it's uh, sort of an honor for me that the people who made these standards, they trust me to convey that standards to you here in uh, a few minutes. And these new Austrian standards, they actually, they, are, they will come into effect. Uh, they will be the, 
the, the, the valid recommendation from, uh, from, from this October. And to give you a brief overview of what they did, I, uh, I, I'll mention the major working lines and you can get the numbers and all the details uh, from the uh, Lichttechnische Gesellschaft, the Austrian Society for Light and the Austrian Standards. And I have prepared uh, a translation service for you. So please contact me if you want the detailed numbers. So first, uh, and that's what you see above, is to, to wonder about where to apply what. And what you see above me is a view of the light dome of Vienna from 110 kilometers from one of the world natural heritage sites in Austria, the Dürnstein Wilderness, the last primordial primary forest of the Alps. And the uh, first concept in the standards is this, this zonation. And this is a highly protected area, so in this area you're not allowed to use any light. And then there are uh, is a series of area, areas, and most of these concepts will be familiar to you. What I want to emphasize here is that in a, in a G area, there is a, a, it's a mixed area between this Greenland, but also, uh, also use of it. There is the, the lunar illumination is mentioned as a reference value, which I think is a, is a great step forward. It's, you're not, uh, you're not, it's not a limit that you use lighter, but it's just as a reference. And uh, other uh, key things, uh, if you can so show the next image, please. Uh, you have the... I, am, I have the... Over. Other key, key image thing uh, relate to the sources, that it's a, this is a helicopter image of the city of Vienna where you basically can see uh, what sources you have. And they uh, now have to obey certain directions. So this is taken from a helicopter downward. You are not allowed to emit into this direction for, you, for the usual lighting. So this should be a black image in the future. And um, you also have to rely on a, a time ski scheme so like with sound protection, there's now a quiet time for light, a light quiet time where you, except in special areas, uh, should not use light. And that is typically the, what you know from sound protection from 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock in the morning. And uh, if you show the next. You oh, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, sorry, I'm. Uh, it is concerns the uh, the flooding, the representative flight, this is a view again from up from the helicopter of St. Stephen Cathedral and see to the lighting system. And uh, for the ornamental or decorative lighting, there's now a limit that uh, requires you to hit what you want uh, to, to emphasize. And that is uh, set to give at least one number in my entire talk to 90%. You have to hit. 90% of your light has to hit the actual ob object that you that you that you that you want to put on. So things like that will be uh, a a, a memory of the past because the, there you see the little shadow. So this is maybe 90% not hitting the St. Stephen Cathedral. Uh, very important is the, they have uh, uh, extended the uh, recommendations, the standards to s sports lighting. And uh, to, to make it very short, the sports lighting is required to not shine across the, uh, across the horizontal and not shine into uh, nearby uh, areas that might be protected, for example. So that's the brief overview and I hope finally with 10 minutes to the coffee break, we enter a severe discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ginter. <laughs> so we have heard about the experiences from Croatia, United Kingdom, but also from, from Austria. I would like to remind you that you can pose questions through Slido, but if you are here, you can raise your hand. Okay, we have first uh, comment. 
or question. So I would like to ask for microphone. And also I would like to remind our um, um, participants on WebEx that they can also raise their virtual hands if they would like to uh, comment or um, have this live question. They don't have to follow only Slido. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. My name is David Kretzer and I'm working at the Federal Office for the Environment in Switzerland. And what I was a little bit missing here are the lighting standards. And let me explain you, I come to my question in one minute, why I think it's an important issue. So I've worked at, as a lighting designer several years myself, and now I'm working for the Federal Office for the Environment and look at light pollution. So every day I'm evaluating projects and I have to make sure that they emit as less light as possible. And what I experience is that the lighting designers are looking very clearly at the standards and they will barely go beyond this, below the standards and I can understand because if they do so and there's for example a car accident, they will say I will not risk that. So this is why I try to explain that we need to look at the lighting standards for example for road lighting but also for sports lighting and for lighting um, of outdoor workplaces. So this is EN 12464 part two. It's the EN 12193 and road lighting is EN 13201. Um, and I often hear in the public, in the discourse, we are looking at the road lighting standard, but let's say, let's look at road lighting for pedestrians. The maximum value is 15 lux. If we look at sport lighting for hockey, it can be up to 700. Lux. So we have, um, as, or 750, we have 50 times higher illuminance recommendation. So I would say um, if we can work on the standards, really look at them, make sure that they are built on an empirical basis, this will have a huge impact because then the lighting designers will change what they do. And, and just to close, uh, Professor Steve Focios from University of Sheffield, he recently published a paper which is clearly questioning whether these standards are based on an empirical basis. And now my question to you is, well, how can we push that? How can we push that these standards are looked at and uh, that it, there's research being done to see are the classes in the standards really based on empirical uh, grounds? And then um, how to push against it? Because just a little comment, the indoor lighting standard that was released last year, it's EN 124641 for um, indoor workplaces, has raised the possibility of um, hor horizontal illuminance levels by up to 2.5, factor 2.5. And we have seen, Mrs. Peskova has shown the final image of the Earth Hour where the buildings um, were, where the light was switched off during the night, during the Earth Hour. So we should also consider indoor illumination, right? And the tendency, at least for indoor standards, is to go up with the recommendations, not go down. So my question, what can we do to change um, especially the outdoor standards? Thank you very much. So who would like to reply? I'm looking at you, Mr. Buchterle. Uh, I, I think it was a very long question, <laughs> but... Uh, it was more comment, an introduction to the question. I think I understood that. So the, what I, I was brought, I, I came here to give a flavor of the standards. It's a big document, they worked 10 years on it, it is full of numbers. But uh, yes, uh, there are some things and the, your question whether they are based on empirical things. A standard is not empirical, it's a convention. And uh, if you have a hockey field, the standard might come from requirements that we cannot imagine because we are not hockey players, or it might come from a sponsor who just wants it that bright. So a standard is not that it's something good, it's, it's a way of convention between professionals that, that in Austrian law a judge can use to make a fair decision. It's not, and I, I'm, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't commit to these Austrian standards. I, I must say that they have a lot of good ideas which, which came into the, in, uh, into, the, into the discussion in the last decade. 
But this is not the end, it's an evolution. Uh, a standard is something that makes uh, clarity and a reference. It's not that it's good or bad. Okay, thank you for the direction. And if I may suggest, uh, maybe we can take uh, further questions uh, from the Slido, because the presentation of Damir spurred a uh, couple of questions regarding the Croatian law and also some specific cases. So particularly, um, Mr. Mohar is asking that the Croatian law has no limit regarding quantities and uh, also there was written or involvement of lighting industry. So would you like to uh, well, elaborate on this question? First of all, um, thank you for the questions. Um, I'm not sure what the quantities actually means. I'm assuming it has uh, something to do with power consumption. But yeah, there is, it's true that uh, Croatian legislation at this point uh, does not have restrictions regarding the quantities of light which are coming out, but uh, we are trying to uh, diminish the light, the light which is coming into the environment as a, uh, as, as a, as a protrusive light through uh, zoning and through the uh, limit values which come with the zones. Uh, in cases that there are any, um, any complaints by the citizens or municipalities or businesses uh, regarding the uh, outdoor uh, illumination systems, uh, public lighting or, or so, whatever, whatever uh, the complaint might regard. Uh, we have um, penalties and we have system in place which will actually inspect what's going on on the field and we have communal wardens and uh, state inspectors which will then uh, provide measures and implement measures or penalties where, where required to uh, diminish the, uh, the complaints and to minimize the obstructions of, of light into, into the environment or uh, to somebody else's window or, or the house or the opening. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And Mr. Rukhter, uh, uh, I just, just, just a comment that on the cap, I think uh, the, what, what the, the questioner has in mind is that uh, you, you are allowed to put as many lights as you, as you want. And that's also with the Austrian standards. There's no cap on how many lights you put if you are ready to pay for it. It's just if you put a light, that are the standards. But there's, there's no upper limit. And I think this is the question the, that... Um, that is here addressed. And from my perspective, I must say that uh, upper limits must come into effectiveness and must be enforced because otherwise we have the same story like with the, the small particles, the Feinstaub in German, <laughs> which go into the lung. Uh, and they don't care about the number of emitters. Uh, the, the children care about what they inhale. So there must be an absolute standard. And that's also true for light, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to pose a question also from Slido um, to, to David. Um, what uh, pieces of legislation do you see now as the most fit for accommodating light pollution reduction? And also how, because we have different systems, legislative, how the UK can cooperate with the EU? And also one comment that it's important that, uh, for example, Scotland is not uh, is devolved uh, from the UK law, so there are differences to be exact. Yeah, it's nice and complicated. Um, so from from a UK perspective, firstly, um, I, as I mentioned, the Environment Act allows us to put forward secondary legislation. So in terms of an environmental perspective, this still remains a, a, a an important area to, to tackle. Um, and also any forthcoming nature restoration laws or biodiversity strategies uh, in the devolved nation also allows us these opportunities from an environmental perspective, certainly. Uh, we also have a, uh, a levelling up and regeneration bill uh, that's currently sat in government, which looks at uh, levelling up uh, across the, the nation um, and will tackle things such as planning. So there is opportunity to uh, explicitly include light pollution there. 
Um, with regards to then the EU and, and how we can uh, work together on this, um, obviously things have been somewhat um, complicated in, the, in recent years. However, uh, there are certainly plenty of organisations such as ours who operate uh, still in the UK and also across the EU. Um, and I think it's really important that we continue to have the collaboration um, and work together in terms of best practice. Um, for ourselves, we helped contribute to the Pollinator Initiative um, and uh, zero pollution action plan. So again, we can bring our experience and, and champion the voice of, of uh, the areas that we represent. And we'll encourage, obviously, other environmental organizations to do the same. But I think it's important we look at this internationally, not least the USA, but also Australia, China. There are examples around the world where light pollution is being tackled, and it's important to bring that together. Um, and uh, COP15, the Convention of Biological Diversity, um, the EU, I believe, are, are pushing to have light pollution explicitly uh, included within the, uh, the targets on pollution. And I think that's probably the, the crucial thing that I would like to see put forward is that light is explicit in either existing legislation or future legislation so that it's not forgotten, it is not pushed aside as a pollutant of emerging concern and it is treated uh, with the same uh, level of concern as, as other forms of pollutant and uh, those kind of international treaties, while it's not necessarily completely binding, it will help to set a precedent that we can we can move forward on. So um, hopefully that will that will help uh, not just in the UK but uh, across the EU as as well. Thank you very much, David. I would like to ask if there are any other comments and questions. Uh, okay, first and the second one. So. Yeah, Maximilian Goldman from Liechtenstein. Um, so um, I'm working in enforcement, partly as well because we're a small country, so we look at the law and also we are the ones that treat it right away. So I'm in a very similar function to David Kretzer in principle, but I also have sometimes the issue that, for instance, for a multi-story parking, well, the planners tell me we need to have 10, 15 looks, whatever the standard for us kind of breaks the enforcement date that we apply. Um, so the question mainly goes to Damir Bartolic. Uh, in the Croatian law, is there a certain kind of superiority of the law towards uh, conflicting standards? Or how is this treated? This is the first question. And the second question, um, which kind of also relates to the one that I see on the screen here, is how is it stipulated that um, this goes into the local planning? Is this on a commune level that is being enforced? Or is it on a more regional level? I don't know exactly about the structure in Croatia there. So thank you for the question. Um, in Croatia, um, we were having a working group when we were actually drafting up the uh, the act, and uh, Ministry for Traffic and Sea was actually very pushy towards uh, implementing certain uh, norms and standards within the act. And we were actually we asked them quite a, quite a simple question: Okay, you have standards and norms, but where are they mandatory? Where in your acts? is it mandatory to implement this standard? And they didn't object afterwards. So um, we did implement the norm in few regards within the, within the, within the act, but actually um, we're not here to uh, enforce their norms. We're here to protect the environment. Now, that should be one of the key points uh, when you're looking for protection of the environment to actually limit, to, to develop a plan how to limit uh, the values, actually how to, how to protect the environment from the obtrusive light. Uh, your second question was, sorry, uh, regarding uh, the... Yeah, more like regarding to how is it implemented on a local level? What kind of measures do you have? I see. So that the community of okay. So the ordinance on zones sets up the zones and also the limit values. And then it is connected to another ordinance which is related to illumination plans and action plans. And it was agreed that the spatial planning is the key information for the basis of 
drafting and adopting the illumination plan. So as the spatial planning of certain municipality changes or is being amended, then you can do one of two things. You can actually uh, amend the illumination plan with the amendments of the, of the spatial plan, or you can do it after the uh, spatial plan actually is adopted. But we have actually given a little bit of uh, free reign towards municipalities to devise and develop their own spatial uh, assets and their special pl spatial plans as they see fit. That does not mean they will have uh, free reign regarding the uh, intrusion into the protected areas or to, um, to in some way, uh, endanger the protected species, no. Uh, the, when the ordinances come into force, uh, we will have, there is an obligation that the spatial, every illumination plan has to be uh, delivered to the ministry for inspection. And if we see something that, which is which is not uh, appropriate or something that is against the law or the, the practice, we will, we will uh, act upon it. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, there was a second question. Okay, Ruskin, can I ask for the microphone here in the front? So with apologies, it was more of a comment than a, a question. And, and just because the standards are so important, I, I actually read the preamble to the European norm this morning, and, and just a few things that jumped out at me. First, it, it does note that they're voluntary, and it says that the process is consensus, open, uh, transparent, and non-discriminatory. Now, clearly, all of that may not be true, but I, I think our experiences here is the importance of getting involved in, a in helping establish the standards. Um, they are not, they, are, they don't necessarily have to be based on the evidence. It comes from us to bring the evidence to the table. Clearly, that's a very long game to do it. But we have seen some success in, in, in the US context recently by bringing some of the evidence to the table for the first time one of the US standards. Again, I acknowledge it's the US, but the same process, I believe, will work elsewhere. For outdoor lighting for outdoor public spaces, for the first time, establishes an upper limit for illumination, establishing maximum levels for spectral, and establishing dimming requirements by getting involved in the process. And again, it can be frustrating. I want to acknowledge that, acknowledge that the EU context is different, but there is an opportunity to get involved in establishing what these norms are uh, over time. And I think that's a really important part of the picture here. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Raskin. And can, I uh, add, can I add to that? Yes, uh, David, just, and then um, Gunter, and then I would like to also read uh, a comment from Annika Jägerbrand, who is part of the CE, CIE. Uh, unfortunately, because uh, we would really love to have the fourth panelist, a delegate from uh, International Commission on Illumination, to be part of the debate, because uh, somehow it is uh, about the standards without the representative who actually works on uh, development of international standards. So, David. Yeah, I think just to uh, to, uh, to to expand on on Ruskin's point, it's not just about standards and the information that needs to be brought forward there, but it's it's also we need to elevate the uh, the impact and the research and the concerns that we all share in this room with our respected governments. You know, it was pointed out that obviously in the, in, in 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 the EU context, it's not being put forward as a concern. Yet we're all here talking about light pollution as a concern. So this is something that I think that we can do, but we can also encourage uh, the rest of civil society to do to elevate those those impacts. And, and certainly my experience in the UK is that the UK government simply do not understand that the scale of the impact that light pollution is causing on uh, on on the natural world. So it, it's not just standards that we need to elevate. It's 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 the entire thing. And I think this is a, a step in the right direction. But we we still need to do. Uh, we still need to do more uh, in order to bring that forward because the evidence is there. Light is a pollutant that is causing environmental harm, yet it is not being elevated up to, to those who need to change that from an emerging concern yet. So um, I suppose that's my, my call for everyone here to, to help us do that. Okay, thank you. And Ginter, your comment? Yeah, I think that we have to face the fact that this is standard is a standard, but uh, there are just too many people who don't care about standards. And I can only say that uh, in Austria, I'm convinced, this is my personal opinion, that we it's not a good idea if we drive with a recommended speed 
I'm very happy that in Austria we have a speed limit, and uh, I think we need a light limit. Okay, thank you very much. And as I promised, I would like to read a comment from Annika Jägerbein that there are activities ongoing to update standards and recommendations to include also environmental impacts. A major problem is to get funding to do the work needed. And maybe because Annika is following us online, if she would like to you know, have a live input and comment, it's, it's possible because we can unmute you. So just raise your hand if you, if you do, would like to comment live. Okay, so please Annika, the floor is yours. Yes, hello. Hello, we do hear you. You can go on. Yeah, yeah it was interesting to hear about the legislation in various countries. Uh, I think, um, and uh, we are working on those in the International Commission of Illumination, but I'm also part of the CEM, European um, Standardization Organization, <laughs> to, to improve the standards. And there is a new group, for example, working on obtrusive light and how to measure it. So there are activities going on. I think the major problem is that, that you know, doing basic research, investigating the impact of light, uh, how you can use it to convert it to a standardized, uh, you know, standardized way of working. It's not the same. Because you have to understand what kind of, you know, how the standard will be translated to a real condition. And so then you need to do other kinds of research, which is maybe not so easy to get funding for. So it's uh, different kinds of research, I think. So to implement standards compared to what the research is saying about, you know, the pure impact. Because we have to know that if we propose something, it needs to be efficient. Yes. Your comment, Annika, and I'm very happy you are with us as well as a representative of CIE. Short comment, Ginter, and then we will wrap up. Uh, I agree with you. The research is very important, but the standards are by professionals of how to make things. So they discuss about the possible and how it ideally should be. Not that they don't address the impacts, basically. It's about making what is possible. It's technology. Okay, well, thank you. So, please uh, clap for David <laughs> and our great panelists. Uh, thank you for all questions. I uh, noticed that there were, you know, calls that we would need uh, more details presentation when it comes also to Croatia and Austria. So maybe we can think also about some follow-up events. And uh, thanks to the European Commission, we have a great also, you know, scheme to do so with peer-to-peer -peer learning between countries. So maybe we can just, uh, you know, think about some follow-up like in deep um, um, workshops. So thank you very much. Right now we will uh, have a coffee break. Uh, we will, um, start with the second panel at uh, 4 p.m. So please be here and also please uh, take a chance and take a look uh, at uh, um, our colleagues from the Technical University, which do, who has a uh, special measuring uh, technology and techniques. Uh, so please uh, visit them uh, if you haven't already done so. So thank you very much and see you at 4 p.m. Actually, actually, see you at 3.55 p.m. If I may add just one last comment that's taking you from, from the delicious uh, foods and drinks. We would really like to make a common picture together. If I may ask you five minutes before the start of the next uh, panel discussion to gather uh, at the entrance door, uh, we will do the picture and then we'll go inside the lecture room. Thank you very much.
So, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Uh, we will start with the second panel. And actually, the second panel will be hybrid. And first, uh, we will have a um, presentation on funding schemes. And uh, afterwards, we will have the two presentations on regional planning. So I would like to welcome here uh, Ms. Uh, Martina Birngruber. Please come here. And uh, we will see a video from uh, Armin Kaspar. And afterwards, uh, Martina will follow in uh, the debate on questions post. Uh, I would like to greet also Mr. Ivo Marcin from uh, Czech State Environmental Fund. Greeting uh, via online Webex. We also do have uh, Mr. Michael Noll, uh, uh, the team manager, uh, thematic on Environment and Resource Authority from Malta. Welcome. And the last speaker will be Mr. Theodor Terich, lighting engineer <coughs> from Technology of the Capital City of Prague. So welcome as well. And I would like to ask uh, to start with the first video from Armin Kaspar on the funding scheme in Austria. Ahoy, my name is Armin Kaspar. I'm working for the Office of the Upper Austrian Provincial Government in the Department of Environmental Protection. My responsibilities include project coordination and initiation in the fight against light pollution. I would like to apologize in advance for not being able to be present in person today due to my tight schedule. Nevertheless, I hope that I can offer a good insight into the opportunities regarding fundings against light pollution provided by the Federal Province of Upper Austria. The Federal Province of Upper Austria supports its communities and their citizens in numerous environmental projects with extensive funding opportunities. I'm very glad that emission protection against light pollution is one of them. To receive fundings from the Federal Province, projects have to be in compliance with the guidelines provided by the Austrian Guidelines for Outdoor Lighting. These guidelines are a manual that include environmentally friendly suggestions and instructions for the renewal and partial renewal of outdoor lighting systems, such as street lighting systems, sports facility lighting systems, parking lot lighting systems, and so on. The concept is based on the GGP criteria of the European Union. There are two different main locations that provide fundings in Upper Austria, but since the majority of these subsidies are provided by the Federal Province of Upper Austria, I will mainly focus on these in the following. However, I would like to mention that the Federal Government grants a subsidy of 30 euros per lamp through the Municipal Loan Public Consulting, if within a certain project at least 20 lamps are converted to energy saving alternatives. These subsidies are supported by the Federal Ministry of Climate Protection, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. The content provided in the Austrian Guidelines for Outdoor Lightning is the basic requirement for a lot of funding at federal province level. The Upper Austrian Energy Savings Association subsidizes so-called energy contracting programs at which a large company, also known as the contractor in the following, offers to pre-finance a local community's renewal or partial renewal of its street lighting system. The contractor keeps the money resulting from the energy savings as long as the local community owes him the money for the renewal of the lighting system. If the energy cost savings are lower than the contractor guaranteed, all expenses are on the contractor's side. So the local community does not have to invest its own capital. If all debts are paid after the end of the contract's period, the local community is granted ownership of its street lighting system. This also includes further energy savings in the future. The Energy Savings Association funds a maximum of 40%, but not more than 75,000 euros of the sum that it raises in the energy contracting 
if Austrian guidelines for outdoor lighting are included in the project's planning. The maximum fundable contract period is 10 years. Regarding pure planning costs, a maximum of 10,000 euros is fundable if Austrian guidelines are taken into account. The budget for these subsidies is provided by the Energy and or Economic Department of Upper Austria. To subsidize a contracting, a minimum investment of 50,000 euros over the cost of the whole project is required. The contractor is responsible for pre-financing, planning, executing and maintaining the street lighting system project until local communities has paid its debts. If the plans of the energy contracting program are based on the guidelines provided by the Austrian guideline for outdoor lighting, an additional 20% of the project sum can be granted by the Environmental Protection Department. If the light color temperature is less than 2000 Kelvin, an additional bonus with a maximum of 50 euros per lamp can be granted. Local communities receive up to 40% of the costs per lamp with a maximum of 400 euro per lamp if they include energy saving lights in their lightning concept plans before implementation. In conclusion, the maximum funding is only granted if the Austrian guidelines for outdoor lightning are taken into account in every step of the renewal process. Because of the variety of subsidies, a lot of local communities were able to renew their street lighting system without investing more money than they would have by keeping their old street lighting system. Hopefully, I have given a good overview of the current situation in Upper Austria. I wish you all the best and a pleasant day at the event. So thank you as well. And greetings to Upper Austria and thank you for making the effort uh, to uh, provide us with the video and I'm happy that Martina uh, Bing Gruber is here with us for the following discussion. But right now I really hope we do have uh, Mr. Martin connected online from the State Environmental Fund to elaborate more in details on the funding scheme in the Czech Republic. So Ivo, do you hear us? Hello, yes, I can hear you. I hope you can hear me as well in Brno. Yes, everything loud and clear. Go on, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, let me also uh, greet you all uh, well and at the same time I apologize and regret that I, uh, due to other uh, working obligations, cannot be uh, with you in person my Brno, in Brno. Uh, my name is Evo Martin. I'm from the State Environmental Fund of the Czech Republic and uh, many, some of you also swear that the State Environmental Fund is also uh, one of the um, uh, funding uh, provider uh, for public lighting in the Czech Republic. I will just uh, try to share my presentation, a uh, very brief presentation. Hope you can, can see my presentation right now. Um, so I said I'm from State and Profound the Czech Republic. Me personally, I'm responsible for uh, coordination of uh, many uh, funding uh, subsidies, uh, program subsidies, uh, especially uh, this kind of new ones. I'm responsible, for example, for coordination of modernization fund, uh, just transition fund, uh, but also uh, me, I'm responsible for, uh, uh, let's see, the uh, overall strategy of the state fund. Uh, so uh, me and my colleagues, uh, we are uh, working on a new uh, subsidy opportunities and uh, providing innovations uh, within the subsidies itself. Uh, about, about the uh, financing uh, public lighting, uh, historically, uh, the state on the fund uh, was, was not only one, um, or is not only one uh, subsidy provider. Uh, we also cooperate with colleagues from Ministry of Industry and Trade, and uh, historically, we had very similar conditions for support. And uh, the difference between uh, state environmental fund and Ministry of Industry and Trade is especially in a uh, uh, location of, uh, of uh, uh, final beneficiaries. State and local fund was more focused on uh, municipalities uh, located in national parks or also in some protected landscape areas uh, as a program effect, a finance from the colleagues within the Ministry of Industry and Trade. Uh, they uh, support the rest, uh, rest municipalities. 
Uh, well, as uh, uh, it was just mentioned, uh, there are some new funding opportunities and new conditions. So uh, for colleagues from the Ministry of Industry Trade, uh, the financing is now uh, continuing through the recovery and resilience facility within the National Recovery uh, Program and uh, State Environmental Fund uh, right now just uh, negotiate the financing from the modernization fund. Actually, we already succeed. So we are right now working on a new call uh, finance, uh, finance from the modernization fund. Um, well, as I mentioned, historically, these uh, two programs, they were, they were very similar, uh, or better say, they have uh, very similar technical uh, conditions and very similar financial conditions. As uh, for national or uh, municipalities within the national parks, there were some uh, bonuses uh, as uh, uh, to reach all these uh, energy uh, effects in the national parks uh, were much more uh, financial financial implications. Uh, as my colleagues from uh, Austria also said, uh, uh, in the state of the fund, uh, also use uh, the uh, guidelines uh, for a better providing uh, the technical uh, level of uh, public lighting, uh, which this guideline is uh, published on the website from the Ministry of Environment. Uh, and uh, but the, as I said, the technical the technical conditions of all uh, subsidies on all the public lighting were uh, very similar uh, to programs uh, uh, operated by the Ministry of Investment and Standard Fund. Uh, in particular, uh, for example, the uh, upper lighting output ratio uh, was uh, set on, on zero uh, for both programs. Uh, the level of uh, illumination or brightness uh, on the road uh, has not exceeded uh, the standard of use by more than 30 percent, and also uh, the color uh, temperature was maximum uh, 2700 uh, Kelvin, uh, but what was uh, after uh, year 2021 is an obligation before before this year uh, it was like a bonus uh, for for the pro for the projects. So historically, uh, both uh, programs, uh, they, um, they, were, uh, as, uh, they were launched as a competitive cause and uh, there were uh, uh, evaluation criteria set on the, on the level of uh, share of energy safe and low consumption within these uh, public lighting systems. Uh, the, the similar ratio was put or emphasis was put on the share of eligibility energy savings expenditure. And that, as I said, there were some bonuses on um, color temperature and uh, uh, also uh, eligibility of the ex uh, expenditure uh, per one life point uh, was uh, for, uh, accounted for a 10 percent within this uh, within this competition. Uh, well, uh, due uh, to this historical subsidy, uh, the program effect. Uh, received uh, historically uh, almost 300 applications uh, all for almost uh, uh, half, half billion of check rounds. Uh, so finally, uh, more than 50,000 50, lights were uh, supported, uh, which mean uh, about 50,000 megawatts uh, uh, per year uh, savings. Within the national program environment for the use on this uh, uh, protected areas or energy parts. Uh, in total, uh, was about uh, 90 applications finally. Uh, finally uh, similar conditions of um, savings per year. Uh, but uh, as was mentioned in the beginning, uh, right now the uh, support uh, through the Ministry of Industry and Trade is to finance. Uh, uh, from a recovery resilience facility. Uh, the call is already launched in May this year, and uh, the total allocation of the call is 1.7 billion chip crowns, and there are quite high ambitions. They're expecting about 2,000 uh, projects uh, with a uh, target of savings about uh, 256 terajoules per year. Uh, currently, uh, they already received uh, more than 200 projects, which is uh, similar to what they received uh, 
for program effect uh, in, 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 uh, in previous in previous period, and the current uh, savings are uh, more than fifty interesters per year, and the allocation is also very similar to um, to the total allocation or recovered by program effect in the previous year. Uh, the conditions. Uh, are, are more or less the same. The primary energy savings, uh, they need to uh, be at least uh, 30 percent and uh, also the replacement I and mean, the color temperature also uh, belongs to 2700 uh, Kelvin. Uh, and uh, all the parameters uh, need to be in line with the uh, proper legislation and the check norm belongs to the public guidance. Uh, for the uh, state amortable fund, as I mentioned, uh, the future support is uh, adding to modernization fund. And as the modernization fund is in the title, uh, we are also expecting to include some uh, innovative technologies within within the support within the public writings. So as the key is uh, really reconstruction of the public writings, all the conditions, all the technical specifications uh, regarding the modernization of public writings as uh, the project uh, need to save uh, at least 20 percent of electricity uh, still there is some this innovation innovation part of, uh, of the technologies which could be a part of uh, this uh, modernization and uh, we are also supporting uh, some uh, elements as for example uh, innovative features for alternative modes of transport, installation of uh, intelligent transport elements and the, uh, optimi optimization. Uh, also, uh, some intelligent elements uh, uh, for uh, driving the waste management systems or uh, another uh, elements uh, which can uh, optimize the energy and water consumptions are also eligible as this concept uh, belongs to the, uh, this uh, general smart this concept uh, within, within the support. And the support, there's, uh, there is a change. There is, a, uh, let's say, some uh, simplicity uh, how the support is uh, calculated. And uh, the total support of aid uh, is uh, given by uh, total and the savings uh, uh, plus uh, the, the times uh, unit savings uh, on check runs per kilowatt, plus uh, the uh, applications also can receive the, or the benefiting beneficiary can uh, can receive the, also this optional cost for uh, innovative uh, technology elements, and also uh, some additional support for project preparation or necessary. Uh, necessary uh, implementation and cost for technical supervision and so on. Uh, well, as I said, uh, the, uh, the, the call, the future call, uh, is uh, of use coming for and generally also concept on smart city elements, but uh, still as a mandatory part is a uh, minimum half, uh, is having the minimum half investments within the modernization of uh, public lighting systems. Uh, there is uh, also a difference uh, between the national park and outside of the uh, national park. Uh, as uh, in national park, the support even could cover uh, all the uh, eligible, uh, eligible cost. Uh, and also the maximum unit subsidy is uh, higher than in uh, municipalities outside the national parks. Uh, so if, you, if, you, if I may ask you to wrap up, since you don't see the timer, but we do see it here in, in Bruno, so if you can just, you know, some concluding words. Uh, sorry, you didn't see the presentation, I'm sorry. Uh, no, uh, I'm just uh, asking you if you, can you if you can wrap up your presentation, so we have time for questions as well. Yeah, yeah, um, I think I'm, sorry, um, I think I'm done, thank you. <laughs> okay, then. Well, thank you very much, uh, both uh, of you. And now I would like to ask if there are uh, any questions from the audience. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to take uh, questions from Slido. Anyone who would like? OK, we have uh, one question over there.
Uh, hello, my name is Daniela Hamidovic, Croatia in State Institute for Environmental and Nature Protection. I have a question regarding your subsidies uh, regarding norm on the roads. Uh, I have to admit that if this is the road that we are talking, uh, road norm that is controversial, then it is not exactly a part of the norm. This is a technical document. So basically it has a different code and it is not promoted also by green procurement. Uh, this is my question, actually. Why do you regard it as the norm if we are talking about the controversial part? Okay, Ivo, would you like to react? I don't think. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if I understood uh, correctly, but uh, uh, what, so if, why we are uh, expecting to meet the, the criteria of the norm? Well, uh, that's uh, uh, anyway. Well, in the situation which your colleagues also uh, belongs to, for example, I mean, some municipalities are also uh, not meeting the uh, current. Situation. I mean, in the modern, within the modernization fund, we know about this. Uh, we are aware of the situation, and still, if the uh, these uh, uh, lightings need to meet uh, the criteria and need to be, uh, I mean, uh, supported in, in a way that they meet also the conditions and could be operated uh, within the current situation, as the as this norm is uh, quite strict on the way. We are also modulating, I mean, the support, for example, for um, a situation that uh, the future, uh, future, uh, or this uh, uh, newly uh, added uh, luminaries will also meet these requirements by this norm, and the energy assessment uh, can, let's say, model the, the situation uh, with the, with the, within the number of the luminaries on the proposed situation. So actually, um, I don't know if I understood uh, correctly, but uh, I mean, uh, this norm is, uh, to me, the criteria of the norms necessary that uh, the uh, public lighting uh, meeting all the requirements uh, needed for operation by the municipalities. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ivo. Uh, and uh, maybe I would like to move on as well, since uh, Ivo Martin has a tight schedule, so uh, we can um, take one question from, from Slido. Uh, it's for Martina. Uh, what's the feedback from the municipalities? Uh, are they happy with the financing scheme and all the you know, provisions they have to comply? Um, yeah, um, at first I want to say I'm a leader manager in uh, Sterngattel Gusenthal. Sterngattel Gusenthal is a low collection group between Linz, the main town in Upper Austria, and the uh, South Bohemian border. And we had, uh, there are 16 uh, uh, municipalities together. And uh, we started uh, 2018 with a best practice example in Kirchschlag. And the, this was a um, uh, totally financed, almost totally financed by uh, the state, <laughs> uh, by the Department of the, sorry, I have to look at the Department for the Environmental Protection. And um, after what we, uh, we wanted to, the, the communities, the municipalities wanted to uh, renew the old fashioned, the really old uh, street lighting systems. And um, they, uh, they started and they were really happy with the uh, pre-financing system because the bigger one they can afford the uh, pre-financing, the, the advanced capital, but the others they uh, had to pre-finance uh, with a contract contracting system. And yeah, it was a big, um, a big amount. And of course, uh, I still hear it. It could be more money. <laughs> uh, this is this is. Uh, yeah. And then we uh, we have another topic, uh, another question, uh, because the street light uh, s system. Okay, it we have uh, fundings there, and we have possibilities to finance 
Tuesdays, but what are the um, uh, what are for the hotspots for the, uh, the the beams for the light pollution beams? For example, the churches and the castles which are lightened in the um, night. And so they came to me in Lida. Somebody of you will know Lida is a, a, a system you can um, put um, uh, you can make uh, projects for the developing of the rural economy and so uh, they came to me and wanted to have um, yeah fundings financial support but we have only um, a little amount we have only three millions of uh, of euros for seven years uh, this is a period and so we cannot finance the lighting uh, uh, system the new in for the castles uh, some uh, a castle um, costs about 150 in the in a really good uh, quality and the churches we want to uh, uh, to do the churches uh, in a new light and with a chablonic system that you uh, that the, the the beam of the light is only on the uh, the building and not uh, out, out, out there and it costs a lot on the, if the owner or the, the association which are busy uh, cannot afford this. So we, we, um, we uh, went to the uh, upper Austria to the environmental uh, protection department and say what can we do? We want to to renew all these uh, things and they said oh we have uh, some good man in the University of Vienna Dr. Stefan Wallner he uh, should be uh, should, should make a, a light analysis uh, for all these buildings um, which are the light now and which should be light uh, should be the light in the uh, future <laughs> the uh, future time and so we have the basic and the framework um, of that we can uh, fight the, uh, against the light pollution and to give awareness to the communities to, new, to the municipalities and this was really uh, good and then we, uh, uh, we we had another expert uh, electrician expert and he's working together with the environmental protection department and he uh, he uh, um, estimated the amounts of the whole and it's about uh, half a million for the whole region and then it was it was really fantastic because uh, we we uh, we have really a good friendship with the Mas Rosket, with uh, the CEO, uh, Mata Grecicova, and we wanted to do uh, the uh, light uh, analysis together then, and we widen up the analysis uh, in the South Bohemian region of the Mas Rosket, and then we uh, said, okay, let's do it together, South Bohemian, uh, you, you are a region with about uh, uh, 35 communities, and uh, we, we have a, a region about uh, 16 communities. Uh, let's do a memorandum. This was the suggestion of the Mata Grecicova to save the night, the dark, uh, the dark night in our region. We wanted to do a dark, uh, uh, dark sky park, but it's unrealistic because there are so many uh, houses and. Yeah, this is uh, we, this is unrealistic. But we want to do that. We have a memorandum, and we have uh, something where the municipalities can go forward, a framework in which we can uh, 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 fight uh, together uh, against the light pollution. Yeah. So thank you very much for bringing up also this transboundary uh, example. Uh, I would like to take. A Two last questions, uh, also to, to Ivo. Uh, is the fund considering restricting the rules for subsidy provision, for example, uh, making the parameters of the new Czech technical standard obligatory? I have to say that uh, the standard is not uh, finished yet. So this is the first question. And then there was a question on the 30% of reduction of energy consumption. Why do you request only 30%?
Evil, are you still with us? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I uh, had a chance to uh, turn on my mic. Uh, yes, uh, so the first one, uh, yes, we are considering, I mean, the continued situation. That was also the reason why we didn't launch the call yet and why we are waiting, I mean, to uh, see all these new obligations in the call. So I just uh, present the, uh, some, let's say, parameters, how this new call from finance from the modernization from this slide, but uh, we are also uh, expecting to uh, provide the new conditions within this call. So, yes, correct, and that was, as I said, the reason why it's not launched yet from the modernization plan. And why just uh, 30 person? Well, actually, uh, this is the situation, the, the current status of, uh, of the Czech municipalities, as I try to present is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, limited in way how these uh, luminaries uh, looks like. And that's why we also thought how, for example, we need, we can uh, meet all these requirements as, uh, for example, uh, for example, the current situation, some uh, luminaries are still missed in the, in the villages uh, with uh, these uh, so energy savings uh, are not uh, are not uh, they they cannot meet uh, these uh, levels of energy savings. That's why uh, for this first call uh, the limit uh, is set. I mean for the modernization fund there is only twenty percent uh, limit uh, of um, saving the electricity uh, production. But uh, actually for the next calls and for uh, future calls we are expecting even to. Uh, be more, uh, be more uh, precise on, on energy savings. Thank you very much. And very last question or comment from uh, the audience. Please, the microphone. Yeah, this is on the uh, Starlight certification that you said is not possible because there are so many houses and so many people live in and I think it's very important that such places where people live in get Starlight certified. And there's a great European tradition for such certificates where actually people live. And uh, I, I, I wrote for the province of Upper Austria a, a document uh, where you find the details of how to certify a region where people are living. And that's important because these people will sleep better. Okay, thank you very much for the last comment. And thank you, Ivo, thank you, Martina. Uh, and now we will move to the second part of our panel discussion, which is focused on regional planning. And we will start with our dear guest, uh, Michael Nolle from, from Malta. So, Michael, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. My presentation will maybe more raise questions rather than answers, and I hope I will turn the table and get the answers from the audience or from, 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 from the panel, or from, from the audience here in, in the planetarium. Uh, that's why I, I, the subtitle of my two slide presentation is very relative short. Is, is, is regional planning actually the solution of light pollution uh, effectively, uh, controlling it uh, effectively? Uh, many countries have regulations in place, have laws in place, and we still see an increase in, in light pollution. So something is not working, right? So, so my, uh, I want to share a bit our experience, why it's maybe not working, you know, sort of rather than giving answers uh, in this regard. So just to, to, to make the framework a little bit, of course, first of all, you have to have a, a legislation in place which deals with light pollution in, in some way or, no, or another. Uh, I mentioned just a few, for example, in Malta, we have the Environment Protection Act, which obviously, uh, uh, like the habits, uh, is based on the Habitats Directive, for example, which deals with the adverse effect on biodiversity. But then we have also from the, from the planning side, we have, for example, the devel uh, development control design policies, which is uh, uh, half guideline, half policy, and uh, also the development notification orders, uh, for example. So, so based on this one, I, I draw here a, a scenario, a typical scenario. So we have our, our inhabited area, the, the, the town, for example, the village, the developing zone, this is the gray area. Uh, 
which is I call now the, the modern part of, of the city. And with it, within, we have then the urban conservation areas, which is normally the, the historical part uh, uh, in this regard as, we, as well. Then we have in green, for example, the special area of conservations, which we then the, the protected sites according to the, the Environment Protection Act. It could be a Natura 2000 site, uh, which is then basically uh, international protected, but it could be also on the national level. Uh, we, for example, have, uh, for example, sites which, which are classified as high landscape value rather than uh, on, 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 on biodiversity. And then maybe one country, some countries might have uh, also Tasca heritage areas, which typically lie within the protected site or it, it's often seen together. I, I presume so. I, I don't think you have a dark sky heritage uh, solely, uh, you know, isolated within the development zone. Uh, so the, my problem is now what I want to raise is as, our, as authority responsible for assessing, I mean, I, I forgot to, to mention uh, my team, I myself and my team is responsible for assessing, for example, development applications regarding air pollution and, and light, lighting. So, and and the main issue is, of course, I think we all agree that lighting is not, a light is not a traditional pollutant in a sense. Light is required. Light is wanted by the majority of the public, uh, by policy makers, councils, uh, mayors, and whatever, uh, even governments. Uh, it's not like air pollution, right? So, so air pollution, uh, nobody wants air pollution. We might not, maybe not care. We still drive our cars. We still fly to conferences like <laughs> like here, <laughs> and we create a lot of air pollution. But it's a, it's a, it's an unwanted side effect. While it comes to to lighting, it's actually uh, wanted, right? So 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 this is this is the the main crook uh, on on the main problem of of the things. When it comes, for example, to policies regarding and and um, uh, which are based on on the planning side. Like, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention another zone. This uh, in, invite uh, the, the area outside of the anything else. It's called we call it Odyssey outside development zone, right? Uh, There's another another one. So, so um, my question is now: uh, the the development notification orders, for example, or the development control design deal with lighting mostly in in urban conservation areas in developing zones. Uh, not within uh, the development zone. Uh, even our legislation, and maybe maybe most of the countries have no legislation in place to protect uh, human health. So there's actually biodiversity has maybe a bit of an advantage <laughs> for once. Uh, but uh, this, is the, this is the situation. And uh, we had a question this, this, this uh, afternoon, early afternoon as well. What do we do with applications uh, which are on the border, you know, to to, uh, to a protected site, right? There could be a hockey ground. We mentioned it, uh, 700 lux uh, hockey ground directly on the edge of our our special area of conservation. Uh, as as competent authority, I have no grounds to reject this project. Nor have grounds to limit the the, the lux levels basically of this project. Uh, obviously. Uh, what we can do is basically limit the impact on this special area of conservation. Uh, how successful this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, different, a different story. Um, so, so just to, to raise a bit of uh, the issue, sometimes you have also, uh, especially in Malta, um, I don't know if it's the case in other countries, uh, of course we have even within urban areas protected sites, right? Uh, just to bring an example, uh, we have we have uh, uh, I live in Gozo, the smaller island on on on, on of Malta, which with with, with sixteen thousand inhabitants, and and uh, there's a citadel in, in the center of the island, and uh, there there are fields around the citadel, which is of course illuminated, is a Natura 2000 site. So so does uh, one size fits all approach applies? Do we have a lighting plan? Natura 2000 sites need to have a have a, have a management plan. Do we have a, a approach one size fits all? So just to bring a few tools we have available, uh, uh, so we can slap uh, any development with standard conditions, which we normally do for 
for for small developments, right? Especially in urban conservation and and then out in OTZ and outside development areas. So if you have a family home, it gets. Uh, uh, no, it's, there should be actually no family home, but there could be, for example, a farm or, or some other development, industrial development, which, which uh, outso uh, out, uh, outside the development zone gets gets um, gets standard conditions. The standard conditions, of course, no other uh, light uh, to be uh, uh, illuminated, not above the horizontal, no spill outside the task areas, for example. Then we can have, of course, uh, different levels uh, of ambition, especially in the development zone. Uh, where we can say where we can play a bit around with the CCT, with the color, color temperature, and especially uh, uh, the, the luminous, flux, uh, lux, uh, luminous fluxes and, and the curfew times. Right? Uh, then we mentioned uh, as well earlier this morning our, our representative from the Commission, the environment impact assessment uh, is, a, is a crucial tool to be applied as well. Uh, so, so here, bigger bigger applications, bigger developments need to come up with a, with a impact assessment. Important note is uh, what also we don't do it, that not every every application which which uh, uh, specifies for an EIA has all the parameters available. So if you have a big development within a development zone, it might get uh, started by regarding equality, but not regarding lighting, which, which does not really make sense. It should be considered. And then, of course, uh, special areas of conservation need a management plan, right? Uh, one answer I can give why, why legislation do not achieve the results, the, the, uh, the desired results, is that you need significant uh, amount of human resources within the responsible authorities. This is already a, 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 a problem. Uh, and you need, of course, competent uh, people who understand lighting, who understands vision, and and uh, so 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 this is this is maybe the biggest biggest problem, why legislation uh, do not grip as they as they should as they should grip. Right. Well, thank you, Michael. Maybe could you just repeat the question you had also for the audience, so you can then receive the answers, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, what's the what's the solution basically? How okay, how okay. how how we tackle. What I, what I do, for example, I would like to say no to, I mean, uh, I, maybe the, the people on the thing, when you're outside, there's a nice, nice brochure of Bruno, you know, and you see many pictures are done at night side with glaring sources, uh, architectural lighting, uh, signs, even during, during uh, low light, low visibility, so foggy conditions where you have very, very bad, uh, uh, actually, it's, it's, it's here, uh, most probably this was done by a tourism authority, you know, so you have your conflict of, of, of interest. I mean, you have your even on the, on the government levels, right? Well, Malta is a uh, 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 touristic country, country, so we need to light up our, our monuments. We need to light up our, our uh, uh, historical buildings. And, and uh, that's, that's the problem. Where we, where okay. we start, where we stop, so how maybe we can how, say no. how we can. Uh, Tackle, tackle conflicting interests. Maybe that's uh, that's the question. So thank you, Michael, for your uh, presentation. And uh, before the questions, I would like to give the floor to Teodor Terek from the capital city of Prague, and maybe he can also show how they are approaching uh, the topic of light pollution. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Teodor Terek, and uh, I would like to show uh, how uh, the capital city of Prague uh, make uh, some concepts of public lighting. At first, let me to introduce our company, uh, the technology Havi Mesta Prahy. Translation is the technology of the capital city of Prague. It's a municipal, municipal company which uh, uh, is provider of, of uh, public lighting system. We make investments, maintenance, service, and build up of new interface, uh, in, uh, new infrastructure for public lighting, architectural, and special lighting systems. Also, some uh, uh, public clocks and uh, public shelters too. Uh, we have a lot of uh, side uh, side kinds of. Uh, uh, de designed and provided. So the base, uh, the basic uh, chapter is a concept of public lighting. 
it's divided into three parts. Uh, the uh, main goal is lighting master plan. We will uh, sp speak about that. And uh, next uh, part is renewal plan and also standards. So it is uh, mean like uh, city standards. Mm. So lighting uh, master plan, it is a tool for maintain and define the nine uh, uh, picture of uh, city and uh, it's a manual how to work with uh, light and uh, how to achieve a good uh, um, good state of the public lighting in the city uh, for that we uh, must we uh, had to uh, we proceed a lot of analysis and done some conceptual documents which consist uh, for uh, from several chapters and uh, also its definition of uh, renovation plan and uh, for standards, but it isn't so interesting in this time. So I go on next slide. Uh, now uh, a few words about the background of uh, public lighting master plan. Uh, there is uh, three uh, main goals which uh, which must uh, we fulfill. It's safety and security, not only for uh, traffic, but also for pedestrians, and that they be able to see some obstacles and faces of another uh, people and uh, see uh, uh, some another uh, important things in the streets. Uh, the next aspect is uh, environmental. Uh, so it's uh, uh, about light pollution, and the third is uh, important things for visitors and tourists, and it's a night appearance of the city. It's connected with architectural lighting. Uh, so, uh, at start, when we started three or two, two years ago, with the creation of a lighting master plan, we have done a lot of analysis. One of the first analyses uh, was the uh, night uh, auto photography of Prague. It uh, was provided on a request of uh, the city, and uh, it is with high resolution, and it is uh, fully compatible with GIC uh, systems. So we are able uh, to migrate it into our data model uh, lighting master plan. In this uh, picture, uh, we can see uh, that the main uh, areas which contributes to uh, lights is, isn't um, public lighting, but uh, it is lighting of uh, uh, objects like airports, some parking lots of uh, uh, shopping centers, uh, brownfields, and other industries places. So uh, the uh, problem of uh, the lighting system is that uh, cap the, the city or, or company can look after only wages, uh, wages under our, uh, uh, our management. Uh, we can, we can, we are not allowed uh, to uh, regulate something which isn't uh, your our. So I skip on the next slide. Uh, the next analysis uh, uh, is analysis of architectural lighting. Uh, Prague has uh, more than 150 objects which are illuminated in the night. And uh, each of these objects and uh, panoramatic views was compared uh, with a uh, night and day photography and uh, has been done analysis uh, what what is the bet on this view and uh, where is uh, uh, some gap for improvement on this uh, lighting architectural lighting <clears throat> one of uh, several analysis uh, is about uh, age of the lighting points uh, i take uh, the picture here because i think it's uh, important for imagine how it's uh, uh, with uh, old and uh, 
with the oh, sorry how it's old the lighting systems uh, where we are now planning something uh, we uh, need to remember that we plan it uh, for a lifetime that is uh, about 40 50 years so if now uh, we make some decision we we must be uh, uh, on the st st stable basement uh, that uh, it is possible to fulfill in the future, and that is the uh, right way. So it's only for illustration. Uh, next analysis were about traffic accidents, because uh, the lighting uh, systems contribute uh, to traffic uh, security. So it is uh, important part too. And, uh, our uh, goal of this conception were that uh, uh, this uh, concept were created in three levels. It is a level of safety, it's about uh, illumination of roads, lighting classes and ATC. Here, uh, second level is about ecology, it's some limitation, uh, it is difficult for obtrusive light uh, and another side effects of light. And third uh, level is about representation. It is about architectural lighting and uh, night view of the city. Uh, yeah, safety, uh, it is uh, only about uh, making uh, some general uh, GIC layer with uh, lighting classes for each uh, uh, illuminated road in Prague. Uh, ecology, uh, the, pra the built up area of Prague and non built up area uh, were divided into ecological uh, zones. Uh, and the uh, representation layer, uh, there are only, mm, not only, it's important, uh, there are uh, additional parameters which uh, uh, reduce uh, some other parameters of safety and it uh, all three layers um, must uh, work together. So if we make some intersection through this, through all layers in the system, we obtain uh, something like that. And it's uh, the final data model of the conception of uh, public lighting. And uh, this system is very ro ro robust. It is uh, uh, Updatable because if some layers uh, has changes through the time, we only change. It's like a card, as and uh, works with the new layer, and all data can be automatically uh, rewrite. Uh, are rewrite, so we have all time actual information, and the concept of uh, uh, public lightings is actual too. So it was, uh, the end was, was very fast. So I'm sorry for that, but my time is um, out. So thank you for the attention. Yeah, thank you, Terry. <laughs> so now we can move to the discussion section. Are there any questions or comments or answers so from the audience here? OK. Well, hello again, Daniela from Croatia. Uh, you asked about uh, how to solve this problem. Well, I would like to say that it would be maybe as difficult as wolf management plan. So you have a conflicted conf conflict topic. It's light pollution. Some people like it, some don't. Some people are against it, some really promote it, some people earn very big money from it. So you would like, my proposal is to make a general action management plan on the European level, which would connect all the stakeholders, make scientific facilitated or just facilitated workshop as all management plans are being done. And also, if you say everybody likes like pollution, we don't know that. Do we have a public opinion about it? Very structured, this is social science. And I don't see anybody from social science here. Also, this is how the uh, conservation management plan in nature protection is being done. 
So this is a vital part of the management plan. Uh, the second thing uh, is uh, I see that you have, uh, in physical planning, you have a lot of jurisdictions, which are maybe conflicting. You have uh, nature conservation, you have cultural heritage, you have road safety, which is debatable. I will repeat here the norm about the frequency of the light bulbs is not a norm. It is not a part of the norm. This norm has four parts. The fifth part, which is attributed to this is technical part. This norm will never be uh, obligatory uh, at EU level. I investigated it uh, with our uh, Normoteca. We have Normoteca, probably you have it here too. So basically this part, fifth part, is not in the green procurement. It is not a part of it. Uh, so my proposal is to as I'm from the nature section, and the message is very clear from our part, night is equally important as day for ecosystem functioning. And we have a biodiversity crisis. And as we like light, we have to admit that light is damaging our health, as sugar is. We like to drive fast, but we have speed limits. So it isn't about liking, it is the necessity. So the EU management plan and action plan should really promote this. Thank you, Daniela, for the comment. Michael, would you like to react? Yes, actually, I want to, to comment on this one. I totally agree with you. Uh, uh, there was also uh, one of the comments that, that uh, not about the uh, uh, he compares with smoking and drinking, basically. And exactly uh, the same thing. I mean, uh, it's true. Uh, if there's, for example, let's say, there's an unlit, unlit document, a uh, doc uh, 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 monument or a church, right? Now, for example, maybe there's in, in, in the lighting plan, I wanted to ask you actually, in the master plan, what the master plan contains. Is so, for example, okay, you just change what's not good, or is it, ah, look, this, there's a dark corner, let's light it up. Why? Why you add new, even if you make it good, right? And the overall will be, no, leave it dark, this part, you know? Uh, this, this is the thing. I mean, it's true, you cannot always do a social study uh, for every lighting project, right? Quite often it's done in the, in, the, in, the, in the mayor's office, you know, at the council, on the council levels, or on the government level. Look, there's this, uh, this church or whatever. It needs to be lit, right? Of course, uh, the villagers are not, maybe nobody complained it was not lit. And then it's lit, nobody complains, it's very bright, right? I have actually a, a very good example in my own, very own village, where, it's, where lighting was not done good uh, as well. Uh, but but the same, the, the, like, like a, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, the main solution for me, I only see is, uh, okay, uh, we have to limit the luminous flux. It's all about intensity, right? Of course, there's basic design, downwards pointing, color temperature, uh, uh, these, these things, yes. But then even, even the con conflict of interest, uh, uh, for example, there's the, the cultural heritage, right? Uh, so we want to light up the citadel. And, and the superintendent for cultural heritage says, you cannot go on and drill into the stone, in the masonry. You have to light it up from bottom, right? So this is, this is for example, like the, the problem. So, so the other solution would be, okay, if you cannot light, and if you cannot fix a lamp on, on, the, on the masonry, don't light it up, right? And this, this is then the, the typical conflict of, 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 of interest. But in my opinion, uh, uh, I mean, when it comes to area lighting, I totally agree with you. Uh, the only so solution is on, on, on uh, limit, limiting uh, but the standards right now. And that's what, what I wanted to mention. Standards was always uh, mentioned many times. The way how standards are written are, these are minimum requirement, right? Forget about even the Forget about uh, that uh, the lighting levels in, in the, in the, in the road, road standard are high. These are minimum requirement. If, if an engineer reads this, he said, okay, I stick to minimum these light levels. In the sports, auto lighting, these are all minimum requirement. 
And, and the problem is this has to, has to change, in my opinion, yeah. right? Well, thank you, Michael. Theodore, would you like to follow as well? Because uh, Daniela mentioned like the social polls, the you know, acceptance of the public. Uh, you described how you approach, uh, like from the technical point of view, did you consider also this uh, you know, field of science? Uh, okay, uh, when I connect my colleague, uh, uh, we tried in the, this um, I think master plan uh, to uh, be uh, down with uh, the level of uh, luminance in the city because 45% um, of roads in Prague is uh, roads uh, uh, it's uh, local roads in uh, built up areas and uh, these roads are uh, classified in uh, lighting class M5 or P3, so we uh, should uh, take it on the lowest level which is possible for safety requirements. And uh, it is 45% uh, of roads, so uh, a lot of, it, it's a huge amount of uh, kilometers. So, and uh, the rest of uh, roads are significant traffic roads. There, of course, it must be higher level of luminance. But I think still uh, the Prague uh, will not uh, bright, uh, bright city, city with a, a big uh, amount of uh, lights which is uh, 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 mirrored upper in, in the uh, upper hemisphere. So I think uh, every um, uh, expert uh, works hard and together that we achieve uh, some uh, good uh, um, quality of the lights for uh, life of, uh, of inhabitants in city. And uh, I, I uh, must mention that uh, we like a provider of uh, lighting, uh, public lighting in city. Uh, we have very, very small complaining about uh, obtrusive light. Yes, it's uh, from all uh, all complainings about that something doesn't work. It's about 2,000 in a year, but complaining about uh, ob uh, obtrusive light is uh, up to 10. So the ratio between is uh, very good. Okay. So, Th yeah. Thank you, Theodore. Uh, maybe a follow-up uh, also what what was said by, by Michael, that in Italy, in most regions, the minimal levels of the standards cannot be exceeded by a law against light pollution, so they become maximum admissible levels. And I have seen another question from Joachim, and then... And, okay, so we have three questions and limited time, so please uh, be uh, brief. So, Joachim, the first question or comment? Yeah, thank you. I have actually a question comment, but it will be brief. To Theodore, interesting presentation on the layers, and I was wondering whether we, you were able to calculate with the master plan that you were uh, developing how much light savings, mean light pollution reduction you could achieve, and how much uh, cost savings you could achieve for the city of Prague. Were you able to do that, and how much would that be? And with that in mind, I want to contribute to the discussion a food for thought. I mean, the, the question of lighting buildings and historical monuments is often done for tourism reasons. Why not let the tourists pay for it? I had to go to, in a church, I know in Italy, I had to put some money in to, to look in the inside of the church, to, to the light on for, for three minutes, to see the, the inside of the church. So maybe we should really uh, uh, look at it from the cost point of view, uh, saying is uh, this all costs taxpayers money? Do you want the, the, the citizens, want this uh, monument to be lit? Or do we want to spend it on childcare, uh, the, the, the heating the swimming pool or other things. So I think it's really important to raise awareness about the costs and the luxury of, of, of uh, constantly illuminating uh, a large number of buildings. Thank you. Uh, with the animation of buildings uh, in Prague, the uh, architectural lighting is uh, switched off uh, uh, in uh, uh, summertime, I think it's uh, up to 11 or, or midnight. I am not, not, not sure, I'm sorry for that, that I, I don't know it exactly, but it isn't uh, in operation all, all hours of darkness. Yes, and in uh, winter, it's switch off uh, after 10, 10 p.m. And uh, 
the next uh, part of question was about calculation. So I'm sorry, but I don't have enough information and, and for I was able to calculate uh, how many uh, costs we are, we are able uh, uh, to reach uh, when we introduce this new master plan. Okay, Martina, would you like to follow? Thanks a lot. Um, I think there is a gap between towns and uh, villages, and the landscape and um, yeah, uh, towns, r r the rural landscape and and towns and cities, because we uh, we are fighting in our uh, region against the uh, empty uh, buildings in the center of the village. This is a most. Uh, um, this is a really um, uh, yeah. Every every second uh, building is empty. You can, and this is really hard because um, we want to uh, renew the life in the village center, and uh, in this center, the the, the hotspots of community were 100 years ago the churches, and uh, the churches are still uh, uh, hotspots because sometimes they they meet around the churches and the places, and so the the majors. Uh, and uh, always, uh, we have to do it, it must be lightened, not the whole night long. This is clear. Nobody wants to afford it anymore. But it's a cultural uh, 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 system. They, she, uh, they wanted to, to show it. They want to, to be worth in the, 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 in the center. And um, uh, with, uh, with the castle, it's the same. Uh, some uh, castles, uh, these are not the Castle or Citadel in Malta, and this is not a hotspot for tourism. This is a, a sign of identity for the people there. They live uh, about 500 years along this castle, and now it's uh, always uh, enlightened. And then we sh should turn off promptly because of, uh, of our crisis. Now this is a, this is a really good idea, but they want uh, they want afford a little of light. They don't want to enlighten with with and lamps uh, or light spots. They want only a few of the uh, of the lightning and only a, a time of till 10 o'clock like this. And this uh, cultural, um, 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 yeah, the castles, for example, are very uh, um, are important for the um, weddings and cultural uh, uh, situations and parties. And so it's it's uh, it's a worth. It's a cultural world, not tourism, maybe, maybe cultural hotspot. Okay. So this Thank was. You. Thank you, Martina. And we had another question from Alejandro or comment, and then very well, last one from Kintra. I'm going to try to be very fast um, on the solutions. Uh, for example, the Spanish law on environmental impact assessment say that any pollutant that impacts our Natura 2000 directly or indirectly needs an environmental impact assessment. Regarding of the zoning, that's a solution. The problem is then implementing that needs modeling and needs the, the, the regions to enforce. So the problem there is the enforcement, not the regulation. And other thing that I wanted to say is Madrid was the brightest capital in the EU, reduced by 50% the illumination level, and nobody noticed it. No, but even the mayor of, or the uh, president of the region noticed it, and they reduced by 50%. Vienna have similar experience. And uh, on the tourism and, and that, uh, many times uh, this uh, permanent lighting is, is make it boring. Now it's always lit. It. I think maybe not as extreme as was pro proposed, but many times when you switch on at different timings and you also show off and on, gives the opportunity to astrophotographers to take pictures with the monument off, with the stars, and on that it gives a different scenario, no? So I think it's, it's interesting. And not every place turn off the, the monuments. I know places in Spain that never turn off the monuments. Okay, thank you very much.
Uh, this was more like a comment. Ginter, last question or comment? And then we will have to move on with the next panel. Yeah, I just want to make it very clear that putting light onto castles is, has nothing to do with the cultural heritage. It is a fashion. Because the castles and the churches never looked like that in their epoch. If there was any light on this castle or churches, it was the beautiful moonlight. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, and uh, I think we have to stop here. Thank you, everyone, for a great discussion. Please uh, thank also for our panelists. Thank you very much. And I hope there will be also a possibility to, to you know, follow on this debate after uh, our workshop is over. So thank you very much. And now I would like to invite uh, our third panel to come here. Firstly... I would like to invite uh, Ms. Kaya Wildmer, a junior, res junior research scientist from Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute, and also Alejandro Sanchez, a researcher from University of Madrid. The third panelist is uh, Georgia McMillan, scholar, Department of Housing and Local Government and Heritage from Ireland. And the last panelist is a student, Ms. Aneta Gruberova from uh, Opava, from Project Emissions. So now we move uh, for uh, the third panel, which is labeled as, uh, as um, awareness raising, but also research. So, well, invitation, <laughs> welcome here. And uh, I would like to start with a brief presentation of Kaya. So, Ka are you ready? <laughs> you can stand, you can uh, please use uh, the thing, the technical thing to move your presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. So, as already introduced, thank you very much for that. My Kaya Wittmer and I work as a research scientist at Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute in Basel. And I'm in the biostatistics group, so we focus on uh, spatiotemporal modeling. Uh, we do that with disease distributions, um, disease estimates, and also environmental exposures such as light pollution, air pollution, whatever. And um, so right now we're working with the European Environmental Agency on this ETC report, and it is a review on the entire topic of light pollution. So this workshop is actually great, and these feedbacks are going to help us a lot to move this uh, report forward. Um, so now I'm going to talk a bit about remote sensing data. And remote sensing data is basically collected by satellite sensors that orbit the Earth and take pictures of uh, the Earth's surface at the night, and therefore we can see the light emissions um, in a geographical distribution. And there are these two different sources, the DMSP OLS, and this one actually measures in digital numbers ranging between zero 63, and it has started to take pictures since 1992. And then since 2012, there was also the VIRS, which um, has been collecting pictures until today. And this one is measuring in the unit of nanowatts per centimeter squared per steradian. I'm going to refer to that as the VIRS unit from now on. Uh, so now, as you already see that these are two different units and two different systems, it's not that easy to actually just use these two sources and then model light pollution since the beginning of 1992. So basically, the DMSP OLS is a really good data set for a long time series. Has been data. Oh, no. Did I break it? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> it has been collecting data for a long time, and it's a long time series of data. And then, on the other hand, the VIRS has a higher spatial resolution. It's actually 40 to 90 times higher resolution. And this directly can be translated into a smaller pixel size. So we get a better idea of what kind of light emissions we have at a certain location. Um, 
So here I show the most recent trends in Europe, um, only using the VIRS data. And this is data from the last eight years. So we divided the data into four different panels where we basically averaged the data over two years. And this is just to give an overview of how these um, emissions changed over the last eight years. So we can see that most emissions are in the range of two to six in the measured VIRS data, which is basically um, representative for a sparsely populated um, area in terms of light emissions. And then we can see that, especially if we focus on the first period and on the last period, that there has been an increase, especially in this small range of light emissions. And then we can also see these dots where the big cities are. We can see Madrid and Brussels and London where we really have these high numbers in the 20s and the 30s. So here this is a bit of a different way to depict it. Um, basically we compared the averaging period from 2014 and 15 to the period of 2020 and 2021. And we show in red where there has been an increase and then in blue where there has been a decrease in light emissions. And we see especially the Eastern European part, there are a lot of red areas. And then we have a more neutral light emission scenario in Spain, Portugal or France. And then if we zoom into um, some spots, then we also see that there is a lot of change, for example, in big cities, we can see blue and red spots going together. And this is also representative for that population movement actually has a lot to do with this. If we, for example, have a big city where people um, change their um, from a rural, um, they live rural first and a lot of people are moving into the city, then this can also translate into an increase in the city um, because people are moving away. Um, so then if we compare the different countries, um, this is a log scale so we can compare them a bit better. Um, we basically in the upper left panel, we have um, the highest light emitters and we see Malta is a big front runner um, followed by Belgium and the Netherlands. And then, so this data is adjusted by the country size, but obviously there are other factors like population density, infrastructure, um, or what kind of factories or markets are actually uh, working there, what kind of um, traditions. A lot of factors um, going into this, but if we just look at it overall, we can see also that um, down here we have Latvia that actually surpassed um, Bulgaria, I think, which is now the lowest light emitter. And then, for example, Czechia is in the upper right panel. It's still a bit above average. Um, so I think most striking here is that the countries at the lower emission scale, they experienced a bit of an increase over the eight years, while the high emitters have been pretty stable. Um, so kind of taking this all into account, we also try to develop signals and there has been an effort at ETH where they basically um, looked at the aquatic and terrestrial Natura 2000 sites and um, they evaluated the impact on biodiversity based on VIRS data. And they used these two thresholds where they basically said that at um, a level of two uh, measured in the VIRS data, there can already be a minimal impact on the biodiversity and its wildlife. And um, that, so this is still on the lower light emission end, but there's already an impact. And if we compare again, these two averaging periods, then we see that percentage wise, there has not been a big increase, uh, a big decrease in the area, sorry. It's only 1.6%, but in terms of habitat connectivity, this can still be an issue because these different brightness spots, they pop up in different areas and can maybe disrupt a big area where there has been an undisturbed ecosystem. And then we also used 0.5 as a really low emission value where there is basically 
um, getting hard to kind of identify which are the artificial sources and which are the natural light sources. And if we model this on a geographical scale, then we see that there has been a decrease in area from 26.6% to 39.4 percent so the truly dark skies um, have been decreasing a lot and this is showing again that especially in the low ranges there has been a big decrease. so thank you very much for your attention thank you Kai and the next speaker is uh, Mr. Alejandro Sanchez Alejandro the floor is yours hi well, I'm going to, to try to show you how, uh, what are the real limitations on, on this data that, that we have. First, we have to understand properly what we are looking at. First, we have direct lights, and then is the things surrounding that is the equivalent to the sky glow. It's not the sky glow because the sky glow is from the ground, but it's the fuse light is going up and, and not down. This is the trends about the paper that uh, Ruskin talked at the beginning. We can say that this 49% is only the lowest limit. And this can be the, the, the gray area is all the uncertainty that we have because these satellites are blind to color. This picture of here that you saw is fake. All the color is don't exist. These are the, the equivalent plot of the measurements with the error bars that we have for Europe. But it's, again, it's fake. That's the minimum. And even you can ask us why you end in 2017. Because 2017, they changed the satellite and they, uh, they changed the way of calibration. They didn't talk to anyone and on the dim light, and we, we have to, to be careful while we work uh, after that. This is how it looks. This is, we have the DMSP regular that have saturation issues and very low resolution. There's a product without saturation, but still I have a lot of problems. We have the beers that increase the resolution and is, is a real scientific uh, instrument but still have a lot of problems i will explain to you now and then we have the iss that is great but the only problem that we have is this is a human with a dslr camera as we have here uh, that can be in they are in color and can be even uh, 100 times more higher resolution than the beers but are not taken in a systematic way even if europe and us we're living in this technology. We had not had a satellite doing that. We have humans taking these images. Then we have the Chinese that they challenge and they are sending commercial satellites with high resolution and, uh, and uh, this is what is available. No? So this is the city of Madrid with beers with the highest resolution of the ISS and commercial satellites in the center. The main problem that we have with beers and the DMSP is that they are panchromatic, and that means, and also infrared and visible, so they mix infrared light that is not useful for at all for our purposes. Then they are blind or very sensitive to the blue light that is where is really the light pollution, the most harmful light pollution. And our sodium lamps are used to have big line emission in the infrared but not vision, not vision, not emission in the blue. But now when we switch to LEDs, they don't have infrared, but they have a lot of blue. That means, for example, the city of Milan, when you see it through the ISS, you don't see any change in the photopic vision, the, the vision that we are using now. This was imposed by the city of Milan on the change. But when you see the impact on health, the increase is, is dramatic, no? because the new lights is much bluer. I mean, the tone of the color is, is really a big, big change. Uh, so 
this can be really misleading. And if then you go to the beers, in the beers you see a decrease. So the light pollution is increasing, but the beers is telling us that it's decreasing. So we have to be very careful with the good news because the good news are not always good news. The bad news are always bad news. Uh, then the MSP are uh, taking at sunset, beers is at sunrise, uh, at, at midnight, and this is Madrid at sunset, and this is Madrid at midnight. So we have to take this into account. We are trying to, uh, to solve some of these issues with using the ISS images. We published this a few weeks ago. We are trying to make maps similar to beers, but with color. So you can see very clear uh, the Belgium is way more orange than the, than the rest of Europe. But we have little funding with this, and we are doing it with very limited resources. Even if someone knows that someone in ISA that can make the, this decision, they could take a DSLR and put it in a window and start having something competitive with the Chinese. We have also products for SkyGlow, this diffuse thing around, but have similar limitations to what I have just told you. This Fabio map that we mentioned, if you go to the paper, is clearly saying, oh, this is the world before the LEDs. And there is a plot of Europe when we would switch to LEDs. And you have nightmares when you see it. Then we have this other paper that we published a few years ago showing how beers is also so sensitive that can be used to trace the sky glow around. This diffuse light is actually what we see from the ground as a sky glow. And it's what you have in the brochure that the Czech government uh, prepared. But there's also limitations, but also good things. For example, uh, you can see the auroras there because it's, it's what is there, is the reality, it's observations. You don't see that on Fabio's map because Fabio's map is a model, it's a computational model of as a radiative, 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 ah, radiative, ah. It's a model, okay? So it's mathematics, it's not real observations. And then remember, we have maps even for sky glow, uh, light pollution on the ocean. But even this paper that is very interesting say this can be even 10 times more that is what is predicted. So this is like a, a lower limit. More or less, that's what I wanted to, to tell you. We can have the technology, but it's not implemented except in the ISS and some Chinese things uh, that are coming and a new satellite is, is, is going to be available very soon. Thank you. So now we move to more awareness field and uh, don't be afraid, we will take also all the uh, data discrepancy uh, questions. But uh, now Georgia McMillan, the floor is yours, please. Uh, I think you have to point there. Yeah, no, it's just taking okay. the red button. Okay, uh, thank you for having me, first of all, and uh, I'd like to thank the Czech Ministry for the, for the invitation and for the hospitality. Um, so it's been great so far. Um, I am uh, working in, with a dual role. So I work in Mayo Dark Sky Park, which is the, I suppose, nighttime version of our national park in, in West Mayo, Wild Nathan National Park. I work for the National Parks and Wildlife, but my dual role is also as a researcher to, I'm currently um, doing a PhD on uh, the, natural, the value of natural darkness to peripheral communities. Um, so where we're based, just so you know, and hopefully we'll get some of you to visit us in West Mayo at some stage. Um, we are on the, the uh, west coast of Ireland, so we're sort of the, I suppose, the last stop before the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it is naturally dark there and um, at the moment, um, but it is changing, so that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, I fortunately, thanks to Alejandro and colleagues, I don't have to explain the maps too, too much, but just to uh, highlight the changes um, that have happened in lighting, um, which is really, um, I suppose, before we even look at them, my study is about um, change in perception and natural darkness. Um, and I wanted to use a quote attributed to David Attenborough, um, which is that uh, we, we won't um, 
protect what we don't care about, and we won't care about that which we've never experienced. And I think when we look at these maps and we look at the dates on them, and they're already quite dated, even the most recent one I have here is 2015, um, we can look at the, the level of natural darkness that we had in 1997, to now to 2015 in the map on the on the right hand side and you can see that um, overhead anyone living in these areas now is is not seeing a natural sky overhead from where they live so in 2015 so for a young person perhaps born then um, they would never see um, a naturally dark sky from their their own home so at the moment in Ireland we have no legislation or public policy uh, addressing light pollution. So that's something we're, we're looking at on a national scale. Um, but um, we do have lighting uh, projects rolling out at the moment to, uh, to change our lighting with an energy efficiency goal. So I think that's an opportunity for us before we perhaps go down the road too far of some of the, um, the LEDs that have been talked about earlier. So we'll, we'll crack on with that. So we have as, as a, a national group, we have formed um, an NGO uh, called Dark Sky Ireland. Um, so it's um, here, this is the timeline, really. And what I wanted to point out by using this is the top line where it started with a, an Irish light pollution campaign in the early 2000s. It's really come from an astronomy background, but now things are changing. So we first had our um, first Dark Sky uh, Reserve in County Kerry in 2014 followed by Mayo in 2016 as a dark sky park. So these places are changing holistically. It's not always now about astronomy, which it was perhaps in the early 2000s. Um, so more recently, we have um, uh, strategies coming into place, looking at tourism um, and looking at the other facets to do with dark skies that are not just maybe astronomy, but also it's important now that we catch wave and we use, we look at it holistically um, which is what we're trying to do through dark sky ireland rather than uh, just the energy efficiency or just the astronomy it's that holistic picture that we're trying to build um, with a network of groups that are um, from all different disciplines so obviously environment but also culture and arts um, and community groups on the ground and that's really where a lot of my work before um, this role at the moment has been on a voluntary basis is to to work with groups on the ground and to see what it is they're looking to do with dark sky as a place getting the accreditation is really only the start of it that's not the so it's what you do with it um, that really counts so we have a project at the moment um, that's in purple there at the bottom um, funded by our Heritage Council to put together a strategy for Dark Sky Ireland to work with these groups on the ground and to hopefully engage at, at national level in the future. So part of our strategic plan, we, um, we hosted some workshops online and we did this word cloud. Um, and one of the surprising things that came out was really, you know, what do people want and what does Dark Sky Ireland mean to them? So already we're seeing a strong lean towards protecting biodiversity and health and well-being. They're two very strong words that came out from it, as well as the obvious astronomy. I'm going to zip through a couple of these now. Um, just uh, again to, to highlight where we are, we're based um, in, in Mayo. Um, we use the number of different stakeholders. I'm going to talk about a, a community project specifically in a minute that has, I suppose, resonates with some of the conversations from earlier today about lighting and heritage lighting and how we light our heritage buildings and why we do. And I think bringing the communities and bringing the stakeholders in is a really important facet of that, that it's not, it shouldn't just be top down and. You know, Ruskin mentioned social justice in, in lighting, and I think that's an issue. You know, we have to um, talk to the communities and see what they want on the ground, as well as just directing them from above as to this is how your nighttime environment will be lit. So it's trying to get engagement. Um, so we have um, different communities. We have our Heritage Council. We have our National Parks and Wildlife all working on this project. Um, so here is one of the examples. So um, un unexpectedly, our um, in the, the town of Newport, which is bordering our dark sky park, so has an, is an issue if it's lit poorly. Um, it was lit j about a year after we got our dark sky accreditation through always well-being. I think lighting um, historically is put on with tensions. 
Um, but obviously the impact of that was massive to, to us, to the aesthetics. And as, as um, Gunther said earlier, you know, there's no better lighting than natural moonlight, really. Uh, the architect certainly never intended a church that way. Um, however, we have that lighting, it was put there. Um, so this is why we wanted to engage the community to say, you know, what, what do we really want to do with this? Do we want to see it um, from afar? Or do we want to actually enjoy it as the cultural heritage that it is? So um, we did a, a, a master lighting plan, a conceptual design. And I have to stress that this was driven from the community upwards. It wasn't something that the munis municipality did, even though they are now very supportive. The community got together, got the funding, went out and, and uh, consulted with different groups, went out and um, I suppose worked with really importantly here, lighting designers, which we have um, quite a rarity uh, for us to, to work with and to really see lighting designers who knew how to light for darkness instead of just blasting a building with light. So you can see, uh, again, the bridge, and I know bridges are very controversial. The bridge at the moment, it shine, light shines up, it shines down, it shines in all directions and all through the night. Um, so that is a key issue that what we're trying to do, I know I'm running out of time, but what we're trying to do is to give it a very subtle amount of light from the inside, keep that public realm space usable for the, the community, and also to, to maybe showcase just perhaps one hour a night for the bridge so that it becomes a very subtle but attractive feature, but only on a very limited basis. I think I might be, yes. Uh, so just about uh, time's up. So again, that's that quote that, you know, let's make people care about this to, to give them a reason to protect it and to do something about it. And with that, thank, thank you. Me. Thank you very much, Georgia. <laughs> and our last but not least speaker of this panel is uh, Ms. Aneta Gruberva. Aneta, the floor is yours. Can I? Yeah, it works. Great. Uh, so hello, my name is Aneta, as, as already was said. I am a student of Silesian Grammar School in Opava and also a member of the Emissions Project, which I will present you now. Who are we? Simply, we are a group of students who either got tired of bad air pollution slash light pollution and decided to change it, or simply wanted to improve uh, their skills in field of chemistry and physics. Our project is divided into three main sections, physics department, chemistry department, and the administration. Each section has two leaders, one teacher and also one student, and specializes in different kind of things. But all members of the project have been properly educated in all the fields. Our project was created in 2012. Back then, we were focusing on uh, air pollution. But after a few years, or more precisely, after we did almost everything we could to prevent worsening situation, and eventually when the situation got a little bit better, we uh, turned our attention to different kind of pollution. And that was light pollution. So since 2017, we have been focusing on this. We still are educating, preventing uh, air pollution, but to a lesser extent than we did before. What do we do? Uh, we continuously educate ourselves and also consult our work with experts as we want to follow the newest trends um, in the field of light pollution and its prevention. We also measure light pollution in Opava, and, and later we create tables, graphs, and maps based on our collected data. We educate secondary schools, and we also present to the public. Presenting to the public is usually a part of annual events such as uh, the European Mobility Week, the Green Week, or the Day of the Trees, and other events where we are invited. But not only uh, do we present to public, so to people who are interested in sciences, 
we also present to politicians as well. We presented to our city officials, which who were so astonished by our work that in consequence, they decided to change uh, light bulbs in our public lantern. We also presented to regional council and our parliament of the Czech Republic. But I think our greatest achievement was when we went to Brussels, that was back in 2018, and we presented our project and our work to uh, European Commission. And we also gave them our initiatives, which actually later made it into new consumer law. On this slide, you can see uh, a part of an email we got from Viera Jourova to who uh, we presented in Brussels in 2018. So she was really grateful we uh, been there and she was really nice and she had a lot of questions too. So we were also really, uh, really thankful. And what about our ambitions for the future? We would like to spread to other countries as well because light pollution is a problem everywhere in whole EU. That's why we are here today. And it's necessary to fight it together somehow and beat it. That's all from me. If you got interested in our project, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram website or school website. Thank you very much. Anita. Well, thank you very much for these uh, examples. Uh, now we will go back to discussion both uh, on the master data, satellite data, and some discrepancies, and also on the awareness raising projects and uh, citizen science or student science. So are there any questions or comments uh, from the audience? OK, Kinter, and over there is the second one. Yeah, this is because Fabio Farki is not here. Uh, and uh, He's <laughs> online. He's exactly. online. Very yeah. good. He, he can he can then say if I clarify that correctly. Uh, on this issue that Falki is a model and Sanchez is the reality, <laughs> uh, I just want to clarify it. The Falki maps are made by using the same satellite data as the Sanchez work. The difference is that Falki calculates how the light that the satellite detects, that is only the light that is shine upward, because the satellite can only measure downward, yeah? so it's only one. And he calculates from that in a prescribed way how light propagates around. And then you get the Falki maps. Yeah? And Alejandro uh, has a more complicated data reduction procedure with less radiative transfer where he uses the small amount of scattered light in the atmosphere to calculate back what was originally emitted. So that is two approaches. Both is a combination of the VIRS that only measures a tiny fraction of the really emitted uh, light and then a, a, a recalculation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Alejandro, would you like to follow up on this? Uh, and also, uh, Fabio Fauci, if you are listening to us, if you would like to also react, please raise your hand so we know that you would like to follow. Yeah, it's, it's basically correct. Uh, uh, just a precision uh, in the data that Fabio used is also included in the SkyGlow. Ideally, we should remove the SkyGlow from Fabio's uh, source data, but our d data was published after, no? And, and the other thing is that I know Fabio is working on a new product on things that we cannot do, no? The light that is scattered up with limited signal to noise, but, but we can see it, but the light that is propagated, for example, to the horizon, 
that has probably much more environmental impact than what we see from the top. I know Fabio is working on that, uh, and, and that is, is something that uh, radiative transfer models can do than observations cannot. No? So there's two different approaches, and the, from my point of view, the main problem is that we don't have multi-spectral, basically in, in plain words, colors, and this has a lot of implications, and it's just because we don't have a camera and the eyes is taking the pictures. Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you. Yeah, this, and, uh, this was of Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, and we do have Fabio Fauci online, so the floor is yours. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, well, um, thank you for giving me the... the the stage. Uh, um, I agree with uh, both uh, Alejandro and Gunther. Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, two complementary approaches uh, uh, to uh, study the, the situation of the, the, the night environment and the, uh, and the night sky in particular. And so, uh, the, the real problem, uh, as uh, Alejandro says, is that uh, we are blind to colors, uh, at, at least at the, the global level, I mean, uh, for the data of all the world. And so it will be necessary to have a new generation of satellite that uh, can detect uh, and colors. And in that way, we will have much more information on the impact uh, of light uh, on, uh, on our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much as well. So the second question goes over there, or comment. Yeah, actually, uh, one comment and one question. Uh, Max Goldman from Liechtenstein again. Um, so the comment on raising awareness, uh, thank you for the inputs uh, from bottom up, so to say. Uh, I'd like to comment uh, on, so to say, our possibility here, as some of us are national, in national administration, of raising awareness that is a bit related to the uh, question from Malti's colleague from the last panel. Um, we actually can raise awareness by um, putting a stipulation into every building application that we get, into telling, I think in Malta, just to come back to the next example, the, they're called local councils, uh, to like have a national letter going to the local councils, you have to put um, you have to put a stipulation into every building application that you get and every application for a change that you get. Um, that is phrased in simple terms. And there we go back to what we had in the beginning. That's just five simple bullet points to follow. Um, so that would be my comment on raising awareness. And I think the question, even though I don't grasp it scientifically completely yet, has almost been answered now by uh, uh, Fabio, Alejandro and Kaya. Um, so I was wondering if you can briefly explain to us who are sci not, scientists, uh, not scientists or not scientists anymore, um, how it is possible to recalculate from a upwards looking emission data to a emission data on the ground May it be horizontal or even vertical? Uh, because that's for us humans is often uh, an important question. If there is just a simple approach to describe to us this in a few sentences, that would be very grateful for. Okay, difficult question and simple answer. Okay, yes. Alejandro. Um, with these satellites, it's, it's nearly impossible uh, with the public data. The, the only way is or with the high resolution, very, very high resolution images from this commercial Chinese that I mentioned, or drones or balloons or planes, but we need to be closer and much higher resolution. And then you can start uh, playing with other things. But we have a chance, and it's very simple, is the digital twins. And that, that is something that is now in the European Commission and in ESA. And we have the tools to, uh, if we have the remote sensing data or even the, the lighting designer, the data that have the lighting designers, we can get then a 3D version. No? And, and then you can play and calculate everything that you want. No? It's a matter of calculation. But it's feasible, but we need these this new satellites with high resolution to get to, to that point. 
Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, Kaya, would you like to add something on? Um, I think it's always important also what you want to find out because with all the data you have different limitations and they need to be mentioned and they need to be considered but it can be used as a proxy for something and you can yeah maybe see trends and, and maybe see on a large scale uh, get an idea of what is happening but there are always shortcomings of the data I guess. Thank you very much. And I would uh, stay with you. There is one simple question whether the research project uh, results uh, will be or are publicly accessible? Well, not yet, but we're working on it. Um, so the report I mentioned we're doing with ET, um, we are publishing it as an ETC report and we're actually planning to get a final version by like mid and November and then want to publish it by the end of the year. But now with all the new things we know, <laughs> we of course uh, want to include this feedback, want to see how we can make it better and we'll definitely have to revise a lot of things. Okay, thank you very much. And now I would like to go to, to Georgia McMillan. Uh, what is the crucial part of communication with the wider public on Croatian, the Dark Sky Park or lighting projects? And I think the same question may be posed to Aneta as well. Uh, well, from our point of view, um, we found because uh, in our community uh, electrification didn't arrive until the 1960s, which is relatively recent, um, so it is quite a cultural shift um, to be talking about um, the dark skies and the concept of darkness um, to people who may see light as a, um, an, I suppose, a, an economic um, progress. Um, so we have done things like events. Um, we, do, we do a lot of work through International Dark Sky Week. Uh, we have a Mayo Dark Sky Festival um, once a year. So the public and the community really get involved in that. And again, really important that it is multifaceted. So it's, it's more than one theme. So, uh, you know, the arts that we engage all age ranges. Um, and we have a lot of variety for people to, to feel they have an ownership of it. Thank you very much. And Aneta? And I'm sorry, I'm going to take this mic off because it's not working properly. I think it's really important to convince people to care because not many people realize that light pollution is that problematic. That is, that is it. Uh, so you must first tell them that it's a problem, then explain why is it a problem and how can it affects themselves because once people realize it affects them, suddenly they start to care. If you tell them uh, you have light pollution and you will have a bad sleep thanks to it, but if you reduce the excess light, you will get better sleep and people actually try it, then usually they're like, it actually works. People must realize that it affects them. So that's the important part from our point of view. Thank you, Aneta. If, if I may stay with you, there is another question. If you are the only school in Czech Republic that does these activities and maybe you have also information of, from other countries, as you mentioned, the European-wide uh, uh, approach you would like to take. Uh, from what I know, uh, we are the only school in the Czech Republic who has um, work it to the Czech parliament or actually change something. There are other projects in other schools, but usually they're not that successful with their work. I don't know why is that. I Maybe it's because our project is probably the oldest from them and also we have large bases as over 100 students went through our project throughout the years. And many of them works now as lawyers in European Commission, there are scientists in Academy of Science. So maybe that's also helpful uh, to us that actually they start with us and they want to help us in the future. And from uh, other countries, uh, we uh, actually were connected with uh, high, school, uh, high school for boys, uh, Devonport High School for Boys in Plymouth in UK for a few years. But as they uh, well, were also interested in light pollution and its prevention, but to not to such an extent 
as we did. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another round of questions from the audience. Okay, first and the second one. Yeah, this is rather a comment. I think it's very interesting. Can you just uh, state your name, please, also ah, for the people uh, online? David Kretzer from Switzerland, sorry. Um, I found it very interesting. We started this session with a kind of um, macro view from the from the sky or from the from above, and then we went uh, down, down, down. In the end, we came to your, which was really from the ground, like a micro um, view, which which I just think interesting. We start from the top, we we end at the bottom, but and we need to, I think, take into account only if we change something at the ground as you are doing um, Aneta, then we will see a difference from the satellite and this is just i think we should really put an emphasis when we do research on what happens on the ground and um, and really think about not only what are the problems and to detect the problems but also to do research how we can solve them thank you very much and the second question or comment Yes, thank you very much. Stefan Marner from University of Vienna. Uh, my research focus is measurement and modeling of light pollution. And I have the feeling that uh, c regarding measurement of light pollution, we are currently running against the wall. We have a lot of devices, a lot of techniques, all have advantages, uh, disadvantages, and so on. And I think maybe this is the right frame here to maybe have the appeal to have a follow-up workshop only to discuss the standardization of measurement methods. I think if we want to do something on an EU level, we should have the possibility to have an intercomparison between countries. If we have three ground-based measurement techniques, we are currently not able to um, compare data from Austria, some data from Germany and so on. So I think we should have an own possibility to talk about standardization methods on an EU level. Thank you very much for this hint. Are there any, any questions from the audience for right now? Yeah, we are almost at 6 p.m. and everyone is ready for <laughs> the refreshments after us. But I will take uh, maybe one last uh, question. And it is also uh, linked to the presentation of you, Kaya. It's from uh, Christopher Kiba. Uh, and he's asking if you, or maybe you have not taken into account the change in NASA calibration in 2017. And he also mentioned, uh, and he sent two links uh, uh, also about that uh, they have developed a correction for DNB. So if you would like to just comment on those like facts uh, that appeared in the Slido. Well, that's a tricky one. <laughs> um, thanks for the links. We'll definitely look at it. Um, I don't think we have. And I now realize that it might be a bit um, premature to just take two years and another two years and compare them. Um, I think, well, I mean, the analysis is also, this is a 60 pages report and I show like four figures. So we have taken into consideration um, a bunch of problems with the data, but I think this is actually a big one that we need to go over again. And um, yeah, we'll see what comes out of it. But now we have the contacts, <laughs> the people we can ask that know how um, yeah, we can make it better. And I think um, yeah, the revision will change a lot. Okay, thank you very much. And Alejandro, would you like to yeah, add something? Um, ju just very quick. Uh, one of the reasons why this happened is because the amount of funding that we have for this kind of research is so, so limited. The, the, in Europe, there's probably only two people, Chris and me, that we are fully dedicated full time on this kind of research. So okay. we really need more more people on this. Yeah, the capacities were uh, flagged out also when it came to Malta and over like administrative capacities, but thank you. And the very last question from Slido goes to Georgia. If the public lighting energy efficiency plan take light pollution into account at all, we know that it's like, dangerous to only focus on energy savings. That's a good question. Um, yes, but um, it really, th how you define light pollution, so what they're taking into account is really the, the difference between um, sodium lights and, and LEDs. That's what the, 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 that strategy would 
um, would consider light pollution. So as we've discussed today, there's so many more issues with um, transferring to LED and, and the light pollution issues. Um, so that's why it, it's opportune time for us to work together um, to, to resolve that as it's not yet fully implemented. So we have a chance to do it. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and also thank you for great examples on like the local level. I think it could be also an um, example for different other cities, for example, also Prague, as they presented before, or Bruno. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you once again for your contribution. <laughs> and now, thank you very much. Uh, now we will move to the conclusions. Uh, part and afterwards we will proceed also with the refreshments and with uh, the wine tasting but before just uh, let me say a few words about the conclusions i have already spoken about uh, the conclusions the Bruno appeal once again thank you very much to those that uh, commented on the papers, there were a lot of you, and we tried our best to adjust uh, uh, as best as we could uh, the formulations. And uh, this is uh, the, the version you have received before the workshop, after the changes were made. And uh, in the preamble, we focus on acknowledging of you know the scientific evidence of effects of living organisms and we are expressing the concerns over the satellite data even with this last panel it was evident that uh, satellites may be blind but still we do have the clues on what's uh, happening on the macro macro level also we are emphasizing the need to protect the night environment and prevent light pollution and its impact we recall already what has been done and internationally accepted within documents uh, under the UN. Uh, we note that the switch to LED lighting sources, although they are more efficient, uh, they may lead to a rebound effect of increased lighting levels and higher amount of blue light emitted due to their spectral composition. Also, we recognize that the recent research is you know, questioning whether the empirical basis of the lighting levels proposed for outdoor standards are well grounded with regards to the effects on the environment even though we have we know that uh, the work is there uh, it's very important to stress it uh, we emphasize that the consequences of overlighting or unnecessary lighting in terms of carbon emissions and cost of wasted energy, and it was raised uh, by many speakers, and its current fuel shortages are surging, uh, are, uh, and also surging electricity prices, that it's a waste of energy. We stress that light knows no border, and we recognize also the absence of internationally agreed metrics uh, for quantifying light pollution and indicators. And I think it also resonated during our discussions. So with our call, the Bruno Appeal, we would like to remind decision makers at all levels, meaning national governments, uh, European bodies, local administrations, municipalities, uh, to use well, simple rules. We narrowed it down to three, even though we are aware of those five as Ruskin presented, but also about you know seven specific. But we try to stick to this as uh, simple as possible, as a guiding guiding principles. And then we call upon European Union's member states, as the Czech Republic or other countries presented here by the state administration, and also to the European Commission. And uh, we heard today that there is actually a lot of going on already, and we are very grateful for the cooperation. So the first thing is to call and acknowledge light pollution as an issue of concern and additional pressure on the environment and human health. And those bullet points uh, below this call, those are the clues that I presented in my um, uh, presentation previous this day. So I will just skim through this. Uh, or maybe I will go through it. I think, yeah, okay. <laughs> to be transparent as much as possible. So uh, we have to address light pollution in the EU environmental protection policies and legislations. 
we uh, have to use the available instruments, as this was also pointed out that uh, the instruments are there, and maybe we need to really find how the tangible ways, how uh, follow them, or maybe uh, also with awareness raising, how to use them more efficiently. Also, we need to review available lighting standards. As we have seen in Kaya's presentation, you know, the Western part of Europe is the same level. And then the, the question is, what caused the same level? And maybe the answer is current standards, I'm just assuming. Uh, also, we need to explore the technology and mechanism for light pollution control, also within funding programs uh, to really make sure the dimming is used, that we do uh, use motion sensors, sensors if possible, um, and that we limit blue light emissions. And that was also showed within like the funding scheme. And it was also mentioned by Joachim uh, that we do have light pollution uh, or light as additional stressor, uh, which is proposed also within the delegated X or to be delegated X uh, in taxonomy, which is a very powerful, powerful uh, um, instrument. We have to take uh, in account the green public procurement. And because we were talking about revision of current standards, it would be also good to review in this point of view the green public procurement criteria that were uh, elaborated in 2019. Uh, we also make to have to make sure that we review the eco-design direct uh, requirement, and it's in place already uh, in 2024. And of course, support research on pollution, uh, light pollution impacts, but also interdisciplinary projects, because as we heard, even though we put together people from different fields, sometimes it's really still difficult to find common language. So as we would have more projects from different angles together, uh, I think it would uh, help us to, to go further in solving light pollution. As it was stated, development of common indicators and monitoring approaches to light pollution is very, uh, a major issue that uh, we have to solve. And uh, also the awareness raising within um, or around the relevant authorities, stakeholders, but also uh, local, local citizens. Within Brno Appeal, we recall the importance of applying the energy efficiency first principle as well as the do no harm principle to every legislative in legislation, investments and planning decisions, as we really need to be coherent uh, in different policies amongst biodiversity, climate and energy policies, and aligning them also with light pollution control. Last but not least, we remind a European-wide approach can build upon on the existing body of knowledge and experiences, as it was showed also from our uh, working paper. And uh, also we have the possibilities to uh, use research financing programs and projects. And uh, as a last thing, we underline that since light pollution already figures on the list of pollutants of emerging concerns, and we have heard from Joachim that, uh, and also from Kaya that it will be embedded in this Outlook report. So we will really look forward to the publishment. And uh, you were also invited to this event in December as it will be uh, broadcasted. So this is our Bruno appeal. And we will present it to uh, Environmental Council. And we will also then pass it officially to our colleagues uh, uh, from European Commission and also to our uh, counterparts at uh, other member states of the European Union. So thank you very much for the support. Uh, it will be available public after our, our workshop. And uh, you are very welcome to, to you know, share it further with other colleagues or stakeholders that would be of interest. So with this, uh, thank you very much for today's workshop. And I will pass uh, for the conclusion uh, words uh, to our host, His Excellency Senator Dusek.
Thank you. Uh, last but not least, uh, I have to say thank you to all speakers. Uh, thank you very much for your visit and uh, your time. Uh, I have to say thank you to all organizers, uh, mainly to the people from the Ministry of Environment. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you to all of you, the visitors here in the planetarium and the internet participants. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, to my colleagues from the planetarium. Uh, now you can join us for the dinner and you can taste our delicious uh, meals and wines, especially white wines. I have to recommend you. Uh, but after the dinner and a few glasses, I hope, uh, you can join us for commented uh, walk and see some street uh, light installations uh, provided by company Technical Networks of City of Brno. Uh, this commented walk will start just outside our building at uh, 8 p.m. and take, uh, takes uh, approximately 60 minutes. Uh, please dress warmly. Uh, the first stop will be near the observatory and the second stop will be in the public park Lujanki. Uh, we will go there by the bus. Uh, our trip will end at the observatory again, so we will return to the observatory after this walk. So what else? Thank you very much for your visit. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, and now, brief introduc introduc introduction uh, of the company Technické sítě Brno. Co kdyby nesvítili v Brně pouliční lampy? Co kdyby přestal svítit Petrov? Co kdyby přestal svítit Špilberg? Vypadalo by to asi takto. Hmm. Byla by v Brně tak trochu nuda. A nudu v Brně rozhodně nechceme. Ale jak to s tím veřejným osvětlením vlastně je? Budíš světlo. Veřejné osvětlení patří mezi nejdůležitější služby obyvatelů. Jako významná součást životního prostředí se podílí na zajišťování naší vlastní bezpečnosti, silničního provozu, ale i ochrany našeho majetku. Světlo je prostě fajn. Nejvíc fajn je, když svítí samo. Ale problém s naším sluníčkem je, že občas zajde a přichází noc. Ale i noc dokáže být krásná. Jsme technické sítě Brno a staráme se o to, abychom v Brně svítili zdravě a bezpečně. Provozujeme více než 44 tisíc svítidel. Z toho téměř 1 tisíc tvoří slavnostní osvětlení kulturních památek a významných budov v Brně. Každý rok vyměníme zhruba 35 km kabelového vedení a cirka tisíc skorodovaných stožárů a přes 20 pojistkových skříní. Výkopové práce koordinujeme s ostatními společnostmi. Svítidla umistujeme také na trakční stožáry dopravního podniku města Brna, čímž zlepšujeme estetiku veřejného prostoru. Současně do výkopů ukládáme i optická vedení, což v budoucnu umožní rychlejší rozvoj Smart City v Brně. Naši technici každoročně vyřeší kolem 3000 poruch. Ano, naše práce není jednoduchá, ale my ji máme rádi. Možná i proto, že naše výsledky jsou prostě vidět. Co ale na první pohled není vidět je fakt, že patříme k energeticky nejúspornějším městům v České republice. Jak je to možné? Využíváme regulátory napětí, čímž snižujeme energetickou náročnost veřejného a slavnostního osvětlení až o 26%. Zvyšujeme počet světelných míst, ale přesto se nám daří trvale snižovat spotřebu. Ale finanční úspora není jediný faktor, který u veřejného osvětlení řešíme. Situace je trošku komplikovanější. Vždy musíme vybalancovat poměr mezi bezpečností, životním prostředím a ekonomikou provozu. Je to vlastně takový trojuhelník. 
Když přidáte na jednom bodě, ztrácíte na jiném. V tom jsou zákony fyziky a ekonomiky neúprosné. Důležitá je teplota chromatičnosti. Co to vlastně je? Jednoduše řečeno, teplota chromatičnosti je barva světla tak, jak ji vnímá naše oko a udává se v kelvinech. Teď právě vidíme světlo, které má teplotu 6500 stupňů kelvina, svítí bíle až modře a imituje denní světlo. Pokud půjdeme s teplotou chromatičnosti níž, svítidlo bude svítit více do žluta. Teď jsme na hodnotě 2700 stupňů kelvina. Podle odborníků na životní prostředí je toto světlo šetrnější k životnímu prostředí. Ale na druhou stranu, čím má světlo nižší teplotu chromatičnosti, tak tím narůstá spotřeba elektrické energie a klesá index podání barev, což má negativní vliv na bezpečnost. Jde prostě o to najít ideální balans mezi bezpečným, ekonomicky udržitelným a k přírodě přívětivým svícením. I proto nahrazujeme stará sodíková svítidla novými moderními typy LED osvětlení. Ale není to jen o nových LED zdrojích. Neustále pracujeme na technologických inovacích, které dále představujeme široké veřejnosti. Tam, kde svítíme, svítíme tak, abychom vám bezpečně rozzářili cestu. Zároveň ale nechceme oslňovat. Pravidelně měříme kvalitu parametrů osvětlení a eliminujeme světelný smog. K tomu již od roku 2011 používáme speciální jasový analyzátor vyvinutý společně s VUT Brno. Z experimentu v roce 2021, kdy jsme vypnuli všechna naše svítidla, vyplynulo, že veřejné osvětlení se podílí na světelném smogu jen ze 40%. Více než polovina jsou několikanásobně přesvětlené soukromé objekty, než je optimální stav. V tomto ohledu se snažíme iniciovat debatu, aby i ostatní světelné zdroje byly regulovány. My u LED osvětlení intenzitu regulujeme na dálku. Máme na to naše vlastní řešení. Využíváme a dále rozvíjíme vlastní komunikační systém, který umožňuje z dispečinku přehledně ovládat cirka 450 zapínacích rozvaděčů. Přesně pak kontrolujeme každé LED svítidlo. V minulosti něco nepředstavitelného. Pro nás je důležité, že co už jednou nasvítíme, to by taky mělo být neustále nasvíceno. A daří se nám to. Dosažená průměrná nesvítivost ve městě je 0,48%, což se vymyká běžným standardům pohybujícím se kolem 3 až 4%. Tak to jsme my. Technické sítě Brno. Nebojíme se nastavovat nové trendy tak, abyste se vycítili ve městě bezpečně, zdravě a neplatili za to ani korunu navíc. Jsme světlem našeho Brna. Okay, so dinner, glass of wine, and a commented walk, and see you again in our planetarium. Thank you.